Hello, friends. Matt Murphy and the Matt Murphy Show getting underway for another day. I have to close this door. I'm going to do it. Uh, Bell K. Uh, is behind the glass making sure that everything that comes out of our speaker sounds as good as humanly possible, and I certainly appreciate him doing so. Bell, go ahead. No, no, you don't have to do that. I'm not I'm not asking you to do that. I'm going to do that. You, you don't have to do that. I forgot to shut the door, and I know how loud I am. Hello, Bell. There he is. You didn't see him, but I did. Um, he does exist. My apologies. I know how loud I am, and if I don't shut the door, then down the hall, there's me screaming down the hall, and the people in the country music world and the people on uh, the queue and our other stations and our sports, ad, they'll get very upset. They do that with the door closed, so they'd be losing their minds with it open. You know, when I was in Birmingham, Alabama, uh, I know that I'm loud. I understand that, and I don't try to be necessarily. It's just the way that I am. This is, believe it or not, my inside voice, and when I was in Birmingham, Alabama, we were on the third floor. Our studios were in a corner of a of a building and in Homewood, which is a suburb of Birmingham. And I'm on the third floor, and there are big glass windows uh, looking out over the city skyline. We were on a Red Mountain. And the that was actually a very nice view. That's a great view. The building kind of sucked, but great view. And people coming into the building from the lower floor's employees would tell me that when I was on a rant, they could hear me in the parking lot <laughs> through the clock, uh, which I don't think they said as a compliment, but I took as one. All right, it's 12.07. May I be the first to say a good afternoon. Hope you're doing well. Super Talk 99.7 WTN. We have a busy day and a busy show for you. It is our episode 535 of our proceedings today. Let's get the pleasantries out of the way. It is Monday. Or Monday? What? No, no, no. I... Better I've already, not be. I've, I've already screwed it up. <laughs> I put, uh, I put, a, I wanted to relate something that happened on Monday today, and I wrote down Monday, and so I'm looking at my thing, and I just read what I see, and I saw Monday, and I said it. It is Wednesday, March 20th, uh, 2024. It is the first full and official day of spring. Uh, first full day of spring, I should say. Spring started at like 10 o'clock last night. Uh, and we have lots to do today. Bell K's behind the glass, making sure that everything that comes out of our speakers, as I mentioned, sound as good as humanly possible. He's also screening your telephone calls at 615-737-9986. We give those numbers often and as quickly as possible just to keep you on your toes. 615-737-9986. That also happens to be our super text line. You're invited to text the program at any point of your choosing, and we will respond to those as time allows. We have Zachary, or Jason Zachary on the show today. I, I believe this is our first opportunity to speak to Representative Zachary. He has an interesting piece of legislation that I want to find out more about regarding banking regulations and demanding that banks can and cannot do certain things with regard to, um, well, I'll let, I'll, I'll let Jason describe it to you at 105 this afternoon. Uh, he's coming on the show then. Cameron Smith at 205 in his normal place, back after a week of vacation, last week being spring break. Uh, he's back at 2.05 today. We are also anticipating a check-in by Brandon Lewis, who is one of the architects of the Protect Tennessee Borders rally that's happening at 1 o'clock this afternoon that Pamela Fur is going to speak at. Um, I was invited by Steve Abramowitz and several others uh, to be at the event, but uh, obviously I'm otherwise previously occupied, so I cannot be there. But I hope that many of you are planning to be there uh, to suggest to our Tennessee General Assembly, and look, I understand that there are some that have decided that if everyone doesn't think exactly like they think, that that somehow makes them the enemy. And I don't believe that's necessarily the case. I do believe that we can take slightly different positions on certain issues, and that doesn't necessarily make anyone taking those positions bad people. So I know that there are some within this Tennessee movement that are pointing fingers at governor bill lee and suggesting that he's doing this on purpose and that other lawmakers are doing all of these things on purpose and i don't believe that's the case at all there are different perspectives about what tennessee can and cannot do when it comes to illegal immigration i believe that illegal immigration has gotten to the point that Tennessee and every other state that believes in American sovereignty, that believes in the American people, that believes in the American way of life, and believes that we can only continue that through an orderly immigration process that has to be reformed and revamped only after the border is secure. 
I believe that it is time to press upon our lawmakers in this state and by extension press upon our lawmakers in the United States of America that we must do something differently. And if that means asserting our 10th Amendment rights in this state, let's do it. If that means challenging Plyler versus Doe, which was a 1982 Supreme Court ruling that demanded that you educate all children in our public education system regardless of their legal or illegal status, then let's do that as well. I'm willing to challenge this status quo to the point that we make some people uncomfortable because, by God, we are uncomfortable. I'm uncomfortable with the number of fentanyl deaths. I'm uncomfortable that Lake and Riley can't that Joe Biden can't get her name right at the State of the Union address. I'm uncomfortable that we're seeing all of these illegal aliens come in and absorb themselves into the fabric of our country. And they have children. And those children are American citizens. And they are anchored here by their children. Never to be returned to their home country and never to face the law for the illegal act that they committed by coming into this country in the way that they did. We have been discussing this issue for the amount of time that I've been in public life. I began my radio career, my talk radio career in 2000, in January of 2000. And for almost a quarter century, we've been discussing this issue. And for almost a quarter century, we have seen gains on it particularly during the Trump administration, we were gaining on the problem, but we never tackled it. We never caught it. We never solved it. We were gaining on it. And had Trump another term, I think he would have caught it. And by extension, we would have solved the issue of southern border insecurity, which you must deal with first in order to deal with the immigration problems that we see in our United States. I'm not against the concerns of the Chamber of Commerce. I'm not against business. I'm not naturally against Tyson Foods. Ooh, that perked a couple of your ears up. I'm against what they're doing right now. I think it's shameful. It is absolutely shameful that a business would choose to fire American citizens and simultaneously have a hiring campaign specifically targeting illegal aliens. Now, I say illegal aliens. I don't say migrant workers. I say illegal aliens. You can call it what you want. Now, why, why would I say that I'm not necessarily... I, I think it's shameful what they're doing, and I can respond with my dollar in kind... What is a business in business to do? Make money. Make profit for themselves and for the shareholders of said company. Employ individuals and help better their lives by extension by getting a work product from them. They don't set immigration policy. Now, should they rise above this from an ethical standpoint? Of course they should. I just want to get to where the real culprits are the culprit in all of this is not the illegal alien that wants to make a better life for themselves i mean obviously there are bad actors in all of these things there are drug dealers and drug smugglers there are human traffickers and human smugglers there are people that are pouring fentanyl across the border there are gang members there are individuals that are willing to commit murder like sadly happened in athens georgia against lake and riley But for the most part, these individuals are a byproduct of their circumstances. And by extension, Tyson Food, a byproduct of its circumstance. I made a comparison yesterday, and I think it's a pretty apt one, to what was going on economically in the South prior to the Civil War. Tyson Foods have, has taken up the Confederate model of business. That we can't keep your chicken prices where they are without employing the slave labor. Tell me I'm wrong. Now, that's just a shark acting like a shark smelling blood in the water. I don't blame sharks who act like sharks. I don't blame snakes who act like snakes. I do blame 
our elected officials who look us in the face and tell us that they're going to do something about it, and then they steadfastly refuse, and they hide. And that's somewhat what, uh, what this rally is all about today at 1 o'clock. Does that mean that everyone in the General Assembly, it's a bunch of bad guys? No. They have been convinced that this is a federal issue and that Tennessee can't do anything about it. I would suggest to you that the, the, the road will be long. And sadly, there will be losses along the way. But this is a fight for the very fabric and foundation of the United States of America. This is a fight for our very sovereignty. This is an existential fight. And so absolutely, we should fight them everywhere we have an opportunity to do so. We should demand more of our federal officials. We should demand more of our courts of law. And yes, we should demand more of our General Assembly. Why wouldn't we? Now, I can hear good people, and I'm not casting aspersions at some of these people, but I can hear good people in the General Assembly saying to me right now, Matt, there's nothing we can do. Matt, we're just one state. Matt, the courts say this is a federal issue. Matt, there's nothing we can do. Yes, you can. You can try. You can fight and die if we must on that hill. Because left to the federal government, we're going to die anyway. As a nation, a nation that cannot define its borders and protect its borders is not a nation, folks. I will harp on this until the day I die. And, and you newbies in the audience that have never heard it before, trust me, you'll hear it again. And for those of you who have been with us for all 535 episodes, you've heard it plenty. If we cannot agree on the basic concept of border security at the southern border, then we are not a United States. And if we're not a United States, we better start figuring something out. I want to tell you guys something. Something that I had not intended on speaking on today. But it's on my heart. I don't know, well, let me put it a different way. Let me start it a different way. I fight to be an optimist. One of the reasons that I always appreciated and loved the godfather of this medium, Rush Limbaugh, was that he was an eternal optimist. He was not a Pollyanna. But he was always everything that was going wrong in the United States of America. He told you how we as an American people could make it right. And I always appreciated that. I have a genuine and sincere fear that we are seeing the beginning of the death throes of the United States. And I'm not saying that to be overdramatic. I'm not saying it because I think it will impact you in any way. I, I'm not, the only reason I'm saying it is because it's on my heart. If we have half a nation that is willing to vote, not just from the largesse of government, which has been going on for a long time now. You know, I'll vote in politicians that'll give me some skin. They'll give me some skim off the top. And the other suckers that vote the other way have to pay for it. That's been going on for a long time. We now have half of the United States of America that does not believe in our borders. You have a sitting representative, albeit in the minority, a sitting representative in the General Assembly House of Representatives that admitted on the floor of the House of Representatives that he aided an illegal alien in his border crossing. And in that context, he said that it was a humanitarian right to come into this country. Unchecked and unfiltered through an immigration system. If it is a human right for anyone around the world to come into the United States of America, then tell me how that 
does not create a dynamic by which the United States of America ceases to exist. And if there is half the nation willing to cede that ground, then I would suggest the next natural step is for people who love this country to bind together and suggest that maybe our course of direction is incompatible with theirs. Oh, that's dangerous talk, Murphy. That's dangerous talk. It's the damn truth. I was just talking to Pamela about a different subject during the uh, during the crossover. And the subject matter was that well, the point I made about the subject that we were discussing was this that we've gotten to a point where we're not allowed to talk about that for fear of how people will react to it. And and I'll tell you what it is. It's inner city black violence. And the propensity to see this on social media platforms. And no one says anything about it. But for fear of being called a racist. Well, no one is willing to say what I just said to you for fear of being called, what, a secessionist? A confederate? I'm not a confederate. I'm not a secessionist. I'm a realist. They have decided the United States of America doesn't matter anymore. Not me. They have decided that we don't have an ability to protect our borders. Not me. And so whether it's political, psychological, or actual warfare, what do you do? You back up to those battle lines by which you have compatriots beside you that are willing to defend with you the values that you so believe in. This is not the middle of the end. It's not the end of the end. It might be the beginning of the beginning of the middle of the end. By the way, it's also episode 535 on these proceedings. You can find us on the airwaves as long as they let us. You can find us on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Twitch, on various social media platforms. On the television side of things, every day, Bell K, I ask him the same question. Are you going to be on television today? Every day he says no. Uh, but he still titles them. 535 is entitled. Murphy Show reminds you, Joe Biden is a lot like a slinky. Pretty useless, but hilarious tumbling down the stairs. <laughs> He's got his new shoes, man. He ain't tumbling nowhere. He's got the hokas. I wear hokas. Hey, don't take hope away from me. Well, that's true. We can, he almost had a tumble up the short stairs on Air Force One. It's 1223, Super
Super Talk 99.7, WTN, Matt Murphy, and you. It is 1227. Hope you're having a good day thus far this Wednesday, the 20th day of March, the first full day of spring. I mentioned Bell K's behind the glass. You know, I got on a rant so quickly, I, I failed to ask you how you doing. You know, I'm you, good. You all right? Yeah, you've, you've been kind of getting into a rant pretty quick the last few days. There's been some stuff uh, on your mind, so we should, shall we say. I mean, it really, it, it, it does prey on my mind. I, I don't want, I, I fight. I, I fight against it. I don't want to give up. <clears throat> and I don't feel like what I'm saying is giving up. I feel like what I'm saying is a dose of reality, and I want to have a conversation with folks about it. Because I've, I've long said that the largest existential threat that the United States make, uh, faces long term is our debt, our 34. What is it now? It's it, Here, I'll, I'll go to the national debt clock. 34 trillion and change. And ch- yeah, you know, who's, count- who's counting? Well, I'll tell you who's counting. The U.S. debt clock's counting. In real time, the U.S. debt clock counts. And currently, oh, <clears throat> drum roll, please. 34 trillion, three, uh, uh, thir- thank you. Oh, that's good. Oh, look at there. That's called producing, ladies and gentlemen. Thirty-four trillion five hundred and twenty-six billion six hundred and eighty-eight million. Oh, I'm sorry, six hundred and eighty-nine million. It just flipped. So remember, how long ago was it that we announced that we had gotten to thirty-four trill? It was like a month or two. Uh, it was. It was this like year, right wasn't at the it? Start of the year, wasn't it? It was at the beginning of the year. Yeah, I, I say. thought so. We're now at $34.5 trillion. We've added, that's not like what we spend. That is how much money we have added to our national debt. That's how much we've borrowed. And as I like to do on occasion, I play the Wayback Machine, and I, I put you in the time machine. And if you want to go back to, I don't know, let's be quaint about it. Let's just go back to 2016, eight years ago, eight years ago. Um, our national debt right now stands at $34.5 trillion. Eight years ago, our United States national debt was $20 trillion. We've added almost $15 trillion in eight years. Uh, I was publicly educated in the state of Georgia, but I think I can do the math on this. That's almost $2 trillion a year. Almost. Not quite, but almost. So there's your long-term existential threat. The biggest short-term existential threat is the political, societal, and cultural invasion that's happening at the southern border. We can talk about this in a way that doesn't make the people that are coming to this country the bad guys. They're not. In large measure, they're not. Some of them are. We focus on those that are. We focus on the murderers and the rapists, and rightly so. We focus on the drug dealers and the drug smugglers and the gang members, And rightly so. They come too. But as I have long said to you, if I grew up in Venezuela, or, well, I guess not Argentina anymore. They've got a great new president. If I grew up in Honduras or Guatemala, I'd come here. What's the, what I, I look at it as I'm not hurting anyone. The onus is on the elected officials, those that we charge with the duty to first protect the United States of America not doing their job. Jim, I'm getting to you in a moment out of Coffee County. I'd love to hear from you guys as well. 615-737-9986. The Libertarian Lunch is currently in progress on Super Talk 99.7 WTN. Also, the Members Nutrition Super Text Line is up and running, and I will answer a few of the questions that I see on the text line, like 4317 says, who is our debt owed to? I'll answer that question next on Super Talk.
Friends, if you've not taken advantage of the Craft Body Scan offer, I encourage you to do it. It it can give you peace of mind, even if you don't believe that anything's wrong. You owe it to yourself and your family to do this. Now, especially if you have noticed something going on in your body and you don't know what it is. Uh, maybe there's a pain somewhere or maybe uh, there's discomfort somewhere or perhaps you're just feeling sluggish and run down and don't know why. Let's go to Craft Body Scan. Let's get one of those heart and lung scans that are normally valued at about $1,300, a little more than $1,300 a piece. Right now, they're offering those for $149. $149 for you and a loved one, whether that's a spouse, significant other, girlfriend, boyfriend, or brother or sister, just someone significant in your family that you want to help. Craft Body Scan can do that by examining the heart, examining the lungs, give you a full report of findings. One of the wonderful things I loved is I, I got my printed out report, or I got it via email. And, uh, you know, after we went over the findings, I, I had a full body scan and I was told that my heart's tip top. I was told that my lungs were, uh, I think, a nine and a half out of 10 for someone, not just someone my age, but someone in my age range. I loved it. Absolutely loved it. Gave me the peace of mind to know that I'm a okay, even though I smoked for 17 years in a previous life. So a uh, craft body scan gives that to you, gives you the peace of mind. And obviously if you're ailing, uh, let's go figure out what's wrong. Go to craftbodyscan.com. That's C-R-A-F-T, craftbodyscan.com. Or call them at 615-436-1000. 615-436-1000. Tell them Matt Murphy sent you to craft body scan. It is Super Talk 99.7 WTN. My name is Matt Murphy. Thank you for being around. We're here till 3. Brian Wilson in the drive at 3 from 3 until 7. It is a part of live and local conversation that starts early in the morning at 5 a.m. and goes all the way through 7 p.m. at night. Information fueled and opinion driven on Super Talk 99.7 WTN. Join us online always on the go on your app, your smartphone. Take us where you go. You download us by typing in Super Talk 99.7 WTN. And we're there for you when you need us. Um, 
Brian has written in and says, dumb question of the day. What happens if the United States of America does not pay our debt? I know personally, if I don't pay my debts, people will come and get my stuff. What happens to the United States? Um, and 4317 puts it a different way. Who is our debt owed to? Sally writes in and says, to whom is the national debt owed? These are all good questions. I am not an economist, but I've been doing this long enough that I can give you a rundown as to what the numbers tell us. The simple answer as to who we owe our debt to, we owe our debt to two entities. The public owes the debt and the government owes the debt. The government finances the operation of the different federal agencies by issuing treasuries. The Treasury Department is in charge of issuing savings bonds, treasury bonds, and other securities by which they finance the government's budget. Revenues that are generated by taxes are used to pay the bonds that come to maturity. Investors, including banks, and I'm reading here, foreign governments and individuals can cash in on these bonds when they reach maturity. The debt ceiling is the cap that is set on what the Treasury Department can issue. Congress continuously raises the debt ceiling to finance government spending, overspending. A deficit occurs when spending increase fa increases faster than revenue. Now, here's to your question. Who owns the debt? The public owes about 74% of the current federal debt. About three quarters. In, intragovernmental debt accounts for 26% of the total amount. And I'll get to those amounts in a moment. I know, I know, you were told there would be no math. And, and I understand that you've just had lunch, and this is probably creating a sour stomach situation, and I apologize. So, the public, so the public owes about 74%. Intergovernmental debt, which I'll get into in a minute, accounts for about 26%. The public includes foreign investors and foreign governments. And these two groups account for about 30% of the debt owed on the public front. And the rest are owed by people who have let treasury bonds or whatnot. So the debt held by the public as of May of last year, and these are the last statistics that I could find, stands at about $25 trillion. This represents debt security, treasury bonds, treasury notes, bought by banks, insurance companies, state and local government, foreign governments, and private investors. The remaining debt, which is a little less than $7 trillion, can be uh, as of last year, is classified as intragovernmental holdings this is basically debt that the government owes itself for example some federal trust funds invest in secu uh, treasury securities therefore they lend money to the treasury in other words the government is literally lending money to itself of the public debt the 25 ish trillion dollars as of last year here's your rundown obviously a lot of holdings here in the united states of america Amongst foreign holdings, Japan holds $1.1 trillion. China owes, uh, owns $860 billion. The UK, $668 billion. Belgium, $331 billion. Luxembourg, $318 billion. Switzerland, $290 billion. And it just goes down from there. Oddly, the uh, coming in at one, two, three, four, five, six, number seven, Cayman Islands. What? I don't know. Weird. In total, other territories hold about $7.5 trillion of our debt here in the United States of America. Now, we are never, ever, 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 ever paying this debt back. Ever. The best that we can hope for is to stop adding to it. 
the best that we can hope for is you continue to roll over those treasury bonds as they reach maturity, pay off the interest rates on the bonds, and continue to recycle what we've been doing all along. If we do not stop adding to the national debt, at some point we will default and we will cease to exist as a country. You will see total and complete financial collapse of our financial market systems. That's my prediction. And I'm not an economist, but I think I'm a pretty smart guy. Steve is next up in Paris. Steve, thank you for the call. How are you? Hey, good, man. That was some uh, educational um, food for thought right there. That's that's good to know. I think you're right on that uh, guesstimate. It's depressing, Steve. It's depressing, man. I'm 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 man. talking and I'm depressing myself. Let's uh, let's make each yeah. other feel better. <laughs> right. So. Uh, on the uh, bloodbath, uh, talked to you a couple of days ago, and uh, I, I, you had to get off of there. I understand completely. Um, time is about you got you got a certain amount of time, so let me try to get to it here. Uh, on the bloodbath comment that Trump was making, that everybody, you know, was regurgitating, and uh, it just made a big mess in the media. <clears throat> I think what people need to realize is that we all know exactly what he meant when he said, "If he's not going to be the president, there will be a bloodbath." But when he said that's the least of it, the least of it meant the car, the EV market is what he was talking about. Because the bloodbath is not going to come from the Republican body or the people that that support Republican issues and policies. The, the, the good moral people of this country, we're not going to run out in the streets and, and cause a bloodbath. The bloodbath is going to come from lawlessness in our country because if he loses, then – the whole judicial system, the whole justice system is going to be like what we're seeing in all these major cities right now around our country. And I'm almost positive that's exactly what he was talking about when he said there's going to be a bloodbath. He meant what he said. He just didn't finish up his his comment. Do you understand what I'm saying? I, I don't in the sense of I don't know that I agree with you that Trump was saying the specific things that you're suggesting he was saying I, I don't know that i understand what you what are you saying that he's suggesting so trump sees it all because he's a he's a smart man and he's he's already been at the highest level that you can be in this country so he he sees the lawlessness in our court systems in our policing and with uh, defunding the police with the way that everything is being flopped upside down and turned inside out with the schools with everything else that's going on trump knows what it's coming to it's coming to a head and it's coming pretty quick unless we can get him back in there along with the rest of the republican body that are good faith-filled moral american citizens that will stand up and fight for this country and take back the freedom that they're taking away from us and he knows that he sees that and he and we all see it a lot of us see it we all think about it you even think about it. You have to know that something bad is coming if he don't become president. I think it's coming either way sooner or later, actually, because the world stage is watching us. And I, I'm going to predict, Matt, right now, that it's going to hit before the election. I'm thinking before – I'm going to say around June or July of this year, when China sees what's going to happen, when we see – when we can predict ahead – when we see Biden's decline, when we see, you know, Trump's not going to make it, whatever, whichever way it goes, I think they're going to they're going to hit us before we realize it anyway. And we're already in World War Three. We're just waiting for China to start the attack and take back Taiwan or to take Taiwan. So we're already there, really. If you look at everything, the Middle East, Europe. We're, we're almost in it again. We're going to be in another Pacific front, except this time it's going to be China, not Japan. Well, and I think, I think you're I – mean, look, look, Trump says what he thinks, and he says what he believes. And I think and, – and I understand where you're coming from. You're kind of looking at it in the macro as opposed to the micro. I don't think yeah. we need to overexamine any of this. Donald Trump was no. talking about the automobile industry, and he was talking about the economy more broadly – and he said that if we don't get a handle on some of the things that are going on from an economic standpoint in the automobile industry, there's going to be an economic bloodbath. And I would suggest more broadly, if we don't get a handle on our economy and our trade imbalances with certain nations, there will be an economic reckoning, a.k.a. a bloodbath in the United States of America. 
That term has been used for years in political circles. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Uh, and I don't think there's anything wrong with what Donald Trump said. I, I think that looking at it from the macro, you can see areas where you can apply that term to major metropolitan areas. You can apply it to our sad, the sad state of affairs with the foreign wars that are going on. You can apply it. I mean, literally there, you can apply it to uh, our border control situation. You can apply. I mean, so there are a lot of different ways that you can apply the term. And so I would agree with you there that, yeah, th th this country is on a downward trajectory, sadly, because of Joe Biden and because of his election. And if Joe Biden continues to be president, that's going to continue too. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure, you know, I know he was talking about the car industry, but if you go back and listen to that very carefully and closely, you will see that what he was talking about, he was thinking about a lot of things and he was speaking pretty fast. But when he said, when he was getting to the point about the, in, about the car industry, the EV industry, that's going to be the least of it. There's going to be a bloodbath. He didn't finish his comment. Go back and listen to that, and well, you'll I'm hear looking it for the, I'm looking for the clip now. I, I don't I don't know I, I don't know. I mean, uh, here's my concern, though, Steve. You, you're, there already you're, is you're a handing, bloodbath. You're, well, but you're handing. I mean, why do you ask us to read between? We're living the in it every day. I, I'm not arguing I mean, with you. I'm, just, I'm, I'm saying, why yeah. are you trying to read between the lines? Trump says what he says. Just listen to no, what he no. says. We don't yeah. have to read between any lines. No. No, he meant. He was talking he about the. It, he, he, he was specifically talking about the automobile industry, and more broadly talking about the economy. And I, I don't understand what. I, I guess I just don't understand what lines no, you're asking me to read through. You got to go back and study it. You'll see what I'm saying. He, he meant what he said, and a lot of people think the same way. And what we, what are you? What are you saying? Thing. He said. There's going to be a bloodbath, but it's not going to be. It's not going to be from his people. The bloodbath that's coming. That wait, 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 what, what are you to, talking about when you talk about bloodbath? When when. From a political a perspective, is, are you talking about people killing people? Yeah, K, just just chaos say say what street, you're trying. Just you're infuriating me. Just say what you're trying to say, man. Yeah, uh, an, an unlawless society of people. Like I don't think I don't think that I don't think that's what Donald Trump was reflecting so on during this. Fast and rapidly under the democratic rule in this country, it will uh, be it will uh, it will be more and more violence. Uh, I agree with you. I agree with you 100. percent I agree with you 100. percent I do I not. Think, I, I'm 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 almost positive that's what he was talking about. I I do not disagree with you that leftists don't know how to lose. I do not disagree yeah. with you that leftists think that they get carte blanche when it comes to American streets if they decide that they want to burn crap down. I don't disagree with you, and I don't think Donald Trump yeah. would disagree with us. But I don't think it's yeah. necessary. To put words in his he mouth. Don't know how to put it into the. He don't know how to put it into the right terms to explain himself when his thoughts come out like that. They just come out. But he wasn't specifically talking about the EV industry being a bloodbath. He was saying there's going to be a bloodbath and let it happen. I mean, we're we're seeing it every day, right? It's already here. But all these media figures, the Democratic uh, Party machine has the media at its, you know, uh, begging call. And anytime Trump says anything a little okay. out of the way, they're going to take it and blow it up. Yeah, but you're you're lending credence to that by what you're saying. I, I think I'm right. I'm just well, I, but then well, no, no, no. You're back. you're agreeing with CNN. No, I'm agreeing. No, that he, yes, you are, Steve. Yes, said. you are. Don't, hey, Steve. Let's no, let, let's be your friend. I do not agree with CNN. Well, that's what's that's what? I do not agree with you CNN. Are. You no. are. No, Steve, you are. No. No, you, you, I'm not. You, I'm, see it? No, no, hold on, hold on a second. Now, now we're friends, and I, I don't want to. I don't want to get off. But, but you <laughs> are. You're saying that what no. Trump really meant was that there would be blood running in the streets. But he didn't further explain what he well, meant. Yeah, yeah, that but, but that's what CNN and MSNBC are saying that he meant, and that's what you're well, saying that he meant. Because they're they're going to take it and they're going to take it and make it whatever they want to out of it. That's why. <laughs> I mean, I I, I don't yeah. think I, I mean the, I mean I, I I look I don't disagree with you that liberals don't know how to lose, <laughs> and if they lose in and thank you, Steve, if they lose in November, it's going to be insanity. When they lose, we're going to have to deal. With more than just thumb sucking, we're going to have to deal with a lot of crap, and we'll take that as it comes. I don't think we need to put words in Donald Trump's mouth. Donald Trump said what he said. He was referring to the automobile industry. He was talking about a bloodbath there. 
Donald Trump speaks on the regular for two or three hours a day when he gives these campaign remarks. I, I don't think I have the sound somewhere. Bell, if you can find I can't find it on my I was trying to find it. Um it's about a minute and a half. I'll find it. I'll I'll do it myself. I'll I'll locate the sound and I'll play it for you, Steve. And I'll go back and I'll listen to it. I don't think you need to put words in his mouth. And I don't think you need to lend credence to some of the garbage coming out of the hashtag. And I don't think that's what you're trying to do, but I think that's what the effect is. It's twelve fifty three on Super Talk. The Dr. Gill Center for Back, Neck, and Chronic Pain Relief is located in Franklin, and I would love, absolutely love it, if you gave them a call, especially if you or a family member are in some sort of pain. Let's discuss. Because, you know, the back, I mean, I, I like to say that I wish my 20-year-old, my 25-year-old, my 30-year-old back would have warned me. I wish my back would have just said, hey, buddy, uh, what you're doing and the way that you're lifting and the way that you're living your life is going to cause you an impact later on in life. It did not. My back did not complain. Now, my back complains quite a bit. And thank you to the Dr. Gill Center for Back, Neck, and Chronic Pain Relief that I have you in my life so that it complains less than it has in years. Uh, upper neck pain and lower back pain, those are my sources of inflammation and pain. Uh, wherever yours hurts, they can help you at the Dr. Gill Center, uh, be it your back, your neck, your knee, your hip, your elbow, wherever it is, they can assist you in living a pain-free life. It starts with a telephone call. For $49, they will get you into their office. Their team will examine you. You'll get x-rays. They'll go over those x-rays. They'll talk to you about what they have found and what they can do to alleviate the pain in your body without the need for pills, without the need for injections, and certainly without the consideration for surgery. Let's get back to a pain-free life today with the Dr. Gill Center. 615-882-4838. 882-4838. For the Dr. Gill Center for Back, Neck, and Chronic Pain Relief in Franklin.
All right, folks, your health care matters. Obviously, you already know that. Where you get your health coverage matters as well. And if you're not talking to Pat Davis and your health plan man, I think you're I think you're doing it wrong. I humbly suggest that you might be. Let's talk about it, because I believe that Pat and his team can provide that uh, provide that sound advice through years of experience. They have over 25 years of combined experience and they can find the right health insurance coverage for you and for your family. And they don't choose from specific insurance companies. They choose from all of the insurance companies and they find the plan that is right for you. For example, their Freedom of Choice plan lets you pick your doctor. It's 30 to 60% lower than Obamacare. The monthly premiums are independent of your income, so there's no surprise tax bill at the end of the month or the end of the year. If you pay for your own health insurance, if you're uninsured, if you're on COBRA, or if your employer insurance just leaves you wanting more, I want you to call Pat Davis and just have a conversation with Pat and his team. 855-4-PLAN-MAN, 855-475-2662. Or better yet, go to yourhealthplanman.com. Yourhealthplanman.com. Tell them Matt Murphy sent you. Hello, friends. It's Matt Murphy, Matt Murphy Radio Show in progress. Hour number two, crank it up right now. Happy to have you with us. Thank you for being here. We're uh, we're that proverbial duck gliding across the water, looking as calm and as cool as the other side of the pillow. Yet underneath my flippers are are flipping furiously as I have failed to do some of my duties. I have failed to do some of my duties as a talk show host to include i have failed to um <laughs> you said duty i did i said duty i have failed to get you this number i'm i'm sent i'm sending you uh as we speak bell zachary's was uh jason zachary's telephone number uh whom we're having on the show here in just like a minute or two uh and i meant to do that during the break but i was desperate to find so right before the top of the hour we had steve good caller steve Steve is a loyal listener from Paris. Steve, I love you. If you're, st I hope you're still listening. I love you. Um, and you know what? Good discussion. Good discussion. But Steve was suggesting that there was kind of more to the bloodbath comment. There were more places that Donald Trump wanted to go with regard to the bloodbath comment, and that he did not do so. I, I don't think that we need to take this any step further than Donald Trump already took it. And I was looking for some reason. I was having a difficult time finding it. On social media platforms and i'm wondering if they're not spiking the actual comment in lieu of you can find any number of media outlets commenting on the comment this is what they do man this is what they do and this is what lends to the conspiracy and i don't even think it's a con conspiracy theory anymore i think it is a fact of life that they are uh you can find CNN, hashtag never CNN, I call it. I'll watch so you don't have to. MSNBC, CBS, ABC, NBC, MSNBC, I mentioned them. You know, any number of news outlets commenting on the comment. Oh, my goodness, Donald Trump's had blood bath the other day. It's difficult to find the actual comment in its totality, but I have done so. Really quick while we're getting Jason Zachary we're on the line. Here's, here's Donald Trump. On every single car that comes across the line. And you're not going to be able to sell those cars. If I get elected. Now, if I don't get elected, it's going to be a bloodbath for the whole. That's going to be the least of it. It's going to be a bloodbath for the country. That'll be the least of it. Okay, so that's what he said. Yeah, he's and clearly talking about shooting puppies. He's clearly talking about the economic circumstances surrounding, once again, Bell K doesn't realize that some people take him seriously, whatever. Um, <laughs> That's not what he was talking about? No, he was not talking about shooting oh. puppies, Bell. He was talking about... He was talking about shooting liberals. No, that's a kid. That's a joke. See what I did there? I went the other... I, I should have gone the other way. That's not being serious. I should have... <laughs> thank you. Now, ah, see how that feels? See? I have to do it for you, you do it for me. 
He's obviously talking about the economy. Now, was he about to go one step further with the comment? And I, I don't mean to retread this ground. We were doing this on Monday, too. But was it he comes across the line, and you're not going to be able to sell those guys. If I get elected, now, if I don't get elected, it's going to be a bloodbath for the whole. That's going to be the least of it. It's going to be a bloodbath. For I, I think he, you know, if I was put in a position where, Murphy, you have to tell me what you think he was about to say. I, was, I think he was about to say for the whole economy. Not just the auto industry, the whole economy. It's going to be a bloodbath. Steve believes that he was reflecting on what the country might do if he was not elected. I don't believe that that's what he was reflecting on. I think if he wanted to say that, he would have said that. All right, let's set that aside for a moment and speak with Representative Jason Zachary, who joins us on the show. I believe this is for the first time. Uh, Representative Zachary has an interesting idea with regard to banking in the state of Tennessee, and we wanted to talk with him about it as the General Assembly continues. Hello, Jason. Good to have you on the radio. What's up? Hey, Matt. Good to be on with you, man. Thanks for having me. Is this our first time together? I think so. I know we, during the pandemic, I think you, because I carried the COVID protection bill, I think you had, I know you had me on then at some point to talk about that. So I think this is the second time. Well, it's good to have you back. I hope you're doing yes, well. Sir. How's the session going in your estimation? Man, it is, <laughs> it's fast and furious. We've had, we, committees are starting to shut down. Most people don't realize outside of the Nashville bubble, most people don't realize we're a part-time legislature. And so we go from, we go from January to end of April, beginning of May. And so Things are starting to wind down. I'm on finance, though, and so we, we still have a couple of heavy weeks ahead with the budget. But we're starting to get through bills. The calendars are starting to wane. Committees are starting to close. We've still got a couple of big issues, but uh, we're, we're good so far. All right. I, I took notice of this bill that you were promoting online, uh, and you were suggesting this is a great thing, and I wanted to talk with you more about it and learn more about it. Uh, your, sure. your post on X was great news. My bill to protect Tennesseans by prohibiting financial institutions from debanking or denying financial services based on their religious beliefs, political views, or ESG social credit score has passed on the House floor up to the Senate on Thursday. Hashtag fair access. Hashtag HB 2100. Talk to me about this bill. What does it do? Yes, sir. Very similar to what Florida passed. Florida has got the platinum, the, the gold standard of what these fair access, access bills have looked like in the country. There's about 15 states that have passed some type of bill pushing back related to ESG, environmental social governance scoring. And that's basically an, a, way where, a, a way of using non-financial factors to determine availability of services. And so what we did last year with the support of our treasurer, we said that the state of Tennessee cannot use environmental social governance scoring, non-financial factors, when making investment decisions. The treasurer has a fiduciary, fiduciary responsibility to get the best possible return and going after judging a company based or and a financial entity based on their environmental and social governance scoring does nothing to maximize and get the best return for investors. So we took the first step last year. The next step is uh, financial institutions. And so this particular piece of legislation, it's called the Fair Access Bill. It's exactly what Florida called it. It simply states, and for most people, this is just common sense. It's a, it's a, uh, a consumer protection bill. It protects Tennesseans, Tennesseans by prohibiting financial services from denying or canceling services based on religious beliefs, which is already federal law. So we're strengthening that with state law. Uh, based on political views or based on what is called a social credit score or or the environmental social governance scoring. And we kind of list the tenets of that within the bill, kind of what a, what a uh, social credit score is defined as. And, um, and I, I won't go through all those points that's in the bill, but it's things like gun ownership, if you're in the fossil fuel industry, that a bank cannot deny or cancel services. So the next logical question is, well, is this actually happening? And I've got numerous examples from across the country, but most closely to us in Memphis, uh, there was a nonprofit last year called Indigenous Adventure that had been a customer of Bank America for nine years. Uh, Bank of America abruptly canceled their, their, their accounts uh, a week before they were supposed to do a mission trip to Uganda. Uh, they then canceled the church that was supporting the ministry and they simply told them it was just a business decision. We no longer want to provide services to your business sector. Um, they couldn't get a straight enter out, enter out of them for four months. And there are numerous examples like that where big banks have canceled services, primarily at checking accounts and, and transfer abilities. They've canceled 
for like Indigenous Adventure, the Arkansas Family Council, National Committee on Religious Freedom, uh, numerous entities. And so our responsibility is to protect Tennesseans and to protect financial services of Tennesseans. So we've taken this step. The application of this, Matt, is important because we use the threshold that's set out from the Office of the Comptroller Currency, that's uh, the Department of Treasury federally, they, they lay out a threshold of $100 billion for banks that they cover. And so we use that same threshold. So this applies to banks with $100 billion assets or more, and that's basically the 28 largest banks in the country. Why, why, aren't, you, why aren't you applying it to everybody? Good question. So the, we have not seen or had any complaints about Tennessee chartered banks, your first horizon, your home federal, your pinnacle. I mean, I know so many of these guys. We've met well, with so, them. We, I talk, well, Jay, but so what? I mean, why, why not go ahead and cover them? And if they're not doing it, they won't mind. Right. Yeah. Well, <laughs> in order to get the bill through committee, the banking lot, the lobbying of the Tennessee Bankers Association is strong. And so we needed to make sure that we got this passed and that we address the issue. Wait, and wait, we wait, did wait. That so you, you, you're admitting that you altered the bill because the smaller banks told you to? No, I'm, I'm telling you that the lobbying against the bill was significant. And yeah, so yeah, they, you, you the, just uh, said, yeah, Jason, you just said what I said. You're, you're admitting that you altered the bill and didn't include the smaller banks because the smaller banks told you not to. No, we didn't include the smaller banks because the smaller banks are not an issue. But the wait, wait, lobbying... wait, 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 hold on. But the bigger banks aren't an issue either. You you point to this one case out of Memphis. I mean, no, are, there, got, are, there, any no, other, got, are there any other examples? Oh, without question. J.P. Morgan Chase for the National Committee of Religious Freedom, they debanked them. I've got a letter on my desk. If, if, the point, the, if the point is to stop all of this, why not stop all of it? And why not prevent the possibility of this happening at smaller banks to begin with? If this is the government's job, Jason, then it's the government's job. I'm of the position that this is not the government's job because I believe in uh, libertarianism or conservatism, right? So, And I think you do too. Uh, but And, and, and I'm, not, I'm not coming at you. I'm just, if you're going to stop what you perceive as a possible problem moving forward, why not stop it for all the banks? We stopped it for the banks where we are having an issue because right now there is not one issue that has been brought to our attention from a small bank. From a okay, small so if that, if, that, if, that, if that happens, is it the government's job to stop it then? If there is a pattern of abuse from the small chartered banks, absolutely. We take an additional step. But right now, they're the six largest banks in the, in the country have 50% of the deposit counts. And so I have a letter on my desk from the Tennessee the, attorney, from the uh, Kentucky attorney general, where he is writing a letter to Chase talking about their debanking practices. I'm look, sure you saw the letter I don't, last week. I don't disagree. I don't disagree with you that Republicans – need to collectively try to protect themselves from being debanked. Um, I, d I just don't believe that it's a government responsibility. I think customers move with their feet, and they move with their money, and they move with their wallets. Um, that's and my position. Can, and, that, and, Matt, they can absolutely do but that. I have an but extreme, the... I have an extreme problem with your admission that the bill was structured as it was structured because of the lobbying wing of the banking industry in the state of Tennessee. Well, the bill was structured in the way it was structured to go after those that were the issue. If the issue were smaller banks, then we, there would have been no changes to the bill. But the bill was that's not what you said. Way. That's not what you said at the beginning, Jason. You're changing your story I, now. You, you said no, the lo sure. I, you said the lobbying wing was strong with these banking institutions, didn't you? It is. Yeah, the okay. one hundred percent. The lobbying, the Tennessee lobbying. The Tennessee Bankers Association is a strong lobbying entity. And, they're, and, and they we, were against including the smaller banks, correct? They're against the entire bill. That's what I'm saying. They, they represent the larger banks as well. So okay. they were literally testifying regarding the larger banks. But we went after those who were the issue. And the financial, in financial institution industry is the most regulated in the country. And so you've got everything from Dodd-Frank federally all the way down to the local to on the state level, the regulation that comes into play. So the big banks have been the issue. Those are the examples that we have. And so the bill went after, the, after those to, to ensure that we protect Tennesseans and we protect the financial services of Tennesseans, that they're just not canceled on a whim. And then they have extreme challenges with financial services moving forward and they can't conduct their business like this indigenous adventure in Memphis, which is the most recent example that we have in Tennessee. I, I 
I respect the goals here. I, I really do. But I'm I'm confused how this is an example of conservative government. That if I open a business, shouldn't I not be able to engage in my business in a manner of my own choosing? Absolutely. You can engage as long as it's con within the confines of the state and federal law. I mean, you can, there, there's always this, well, you can't do this to the private sector. Well, when the left weaponizes the private sector and the, the financial institutions against primarily religious institutions within a state or conservative groups, then it's our responsibility as a Republican group, a Republican Party to stand against those. And that's the reason Governor DeSantis has done it. That's the reason numerous conservative states have taken this step. Fifteen different states have passed some semblance of an ESG bill to be able to protect. Well, no, no, no. And I'm talking about, I mean, all, most of us can most of us can agree on the ESG stuff. I'm thinking more broadly about a government responsibility to infringe upon the rights of businesses who, you know, I mean, Citizens United indicated that businesses are allowed to speak politically, right? That they are considered, that the, their voices matter too. So I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to broaden this out and recognize where it might be applied in places that we don't like it. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a good friend of mine, Cameron Smith, wrote in the Tennessee and about the, the Colorado cake baker, where we were arguing that the cake baker should not be forced to make a cake for a gay marriage, that it is his business and his right to make those particular determinations uh, based on his belief structure and the structure of his company. Yet it feels like your bill's doing that same thing, only in reverse, where you're going after these woke companies and demanding that they structure their business in a way determined by the government. Well, in, in Dodd-Frank, the terrible bill of Dodd-Frank, it gives states the ability, as long as it's under the consumer protection umbrella, to be more stringent than federal government in certain cases. And as long as it's under consumer protection, so that's what this does. It literally puts this under the Tennessee Consumer Protection Act of 1977, to give the attorney general's office the ability to investigate when an entity calls into his office and says that we've been debanked because of this. We feel like this is take this step has been taken for against us based on our religious, religious views, political views. We're a gun manufacturer, whatever it may be. We're now equipping them and giving them the tools to be able to do that. And there's also a notification piece in this bill that says that the, the whatever institution debanks or cancel services, they have to provide notification to that person within 30 days to let them know why they have been debanked. And then you, you kind of bring up the Colorado bake, the cake baker, that was kind of brought up in committee. It's, it's really apples and oranges because that is a non-regulated entity. The financial institutions are significantly all business, regulated. Dude, all businesses have to have licenses. All businesses are regulated. Come on, man. Well, of course, of course. They're well, all, they're, don't, they're call them, don't call them non-regulated then. Are they? I mean, they all have licenses. Well, they all have to right. They all have to beg. They all have to get on bended knee and beg before the government of the state of Tennessee to be allowed to do business. But there's no comparison between the regulation of a financial institution. No, no, no. I'm, 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 in the, I'm, in, I'm in favor of deregulating, not overly regulating. That's That's called conservatism. Well, conservatism is also protecting the people of your state when the government weaponizes certain entities. Well, I, certain I think, it, but I think I think your state. bill's picking winners and losers. Does the bill in Florida include all banks or just the big ones? It includes all banks, but you didn't. I did not. We went after the banks where we see the most challenges within within the financial institutions within the financial industry. Went at we. We addressed it structured in a way using the threshold that's laid out by the Department of Treasury to ensure we address those cases to where we have the complaints and have the issues. All right. I mean, I just look, uh, 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 Jason, I like you. Uh, I just I, I, I disagree that this is the government's job. I, I just disagree uh, that a government that believes in l less government being better and less regulation being better. I just I just disagree. I, I think it's an easy get. Uh, because of the com ESG component, but uh, you and I can disagree and 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 not not still be friends. I I'll let the voters and the listeners decide where they are on it, uh, and I wish you best of luck as as it moves through the Senate, and um, and we'll let the audience decide. How about that? All right, buddy. thanks, man. Right, man. Thank you. There's Jason Zachary, whom I have never spoken with uh, because I was not here during the pandemic, so I don't 
I don't know who Jason was talking with during the pandemic, but it was not me. But I mean, look, I, this is not, it's absolutely not personal. I just don't think, uh, this is where my libertarian streak gets really, really broad and really, really wide. And I understand that this is easy pickings because people don't like banks. And people sure as hell don't like ESG, all this social justice garbage. I just don't think it's the role of the government of the United States of America to tell private businesses how to do their jobs. And we, as an American people, can vote with our wallets and our dollars. And if you don't like the way that the liberal Bank of America is doing its business, guess what you can do? You can take your business somewhere else. You can take your business to a credit union. You can take your business to a smaller bank, which I encourage you to do. They'll be more receptive to the way that you want them to do business. I do not believe the answer is always to running to government and getting government to do it for you. Secondarily, I think it's a little interesting that he answered the question one way at the beginning with regard to big and small banks and, and a different way at the end. But that's just me. 123 Super Talk 99.7 WTF. Hey, friends, Matt Murphy here for Members Nutrition. I sat down with the team at Members Nutrition. I was so impressed. I was impressed with a number of things. One, uh, just the model. Their business model just made sense to me. One, I think we over-medicate in the United States of America, and they do as well. They believe that so much of what you need comes to you naturally through natural vitamins and supplements available to you right here in the good old USA. And they believe that you're paying too much for them. When you go into the brick and mortar and you grab some vitamins or, you know, whatever they might be, supplements and whatnot, uh, they think that you overpay. And I believe that, too. And you'll see it for yourself when you go to the Members Nutrition website. Because not only are they already lower than most of the, most of the places that you go to around for your vitamins, for your supplements, for your cleanse, for your weight loss stuff, for your men's health, women's health, no matter what you need, they have it for you at Members Nutrition, and they have it for less money. And right now, you go and you'll get discounted an additional 50%, and you don't have to type in anything. You don't have to do anything. There's no special codes. They take the discount at the register. I've done this. I just ordered a couple of days ago from Members Nutrition. It arrived on my door within 48 hours. How about that for Jiffy Quick? MembersNutrition.com. That's MembersNutrition.com.
I should be nicer. That according to one of our loyal listeners who says that they're trying to be good. They're trying to, uh, wh- where was it? Did you respond to this guy, Bell? I was trying to respond. Before to you did. I can't find, well, I can't find it because when you respond, it shifts in my profile over here. And so no, then I can't I find it to share on the you radio. talked to him. Oh, did I? I can't remember. Maybe he's responded back. Um, he says that I'm being that he's trying to be nice and he's trying to like my show, but I yell at everybody. Like you just yelled at me. <laughs> Somebody said you needed a hug, and I told them I, that I tried. And you threw a shoe at me, and I just responded to that person. I said it's fake news. I'm wearing boots. I threw a boot. I at didn't you. say you threw your shoe at me. <laughs> I don't. I don't mean to be nasty. I. I want to be. You know, I committed to 2024 to be a joyful warrior. And so far, that's not going so well. Yelling at people, kicking them out of my studio. We need to keep that kick out, by the way. We weren't able to use it for the, uh, what is that, uh, the Tennessee Broadcasters Association Awards? Yeah. We weren't able to use it last year, so we need to keep that for next year. Okay. I'm sure they'll love that, me, me booting a politician out of the studio. I'm a, uh, uh, Regarding this whole subject, though, I'm a little confused as to why, how they're able to debank people without a specific reason. Is that to avoid? I don't the, think they can. I, I, like I, if you're breaking the law, right? obviously they can do that, and, go, and but they have to report you to the, the feds. But if they just don't like the fact that, you know, you're a gun seller how can they i don't i don't understand okay this. hb 2100 as presented by representative jason zachary restricts the ability of financial institutions and insurance companies to quote discriminate against a person in providing services or terms on the basis of the person's political opinion speech or affiliation or any factor not a quantitative impartial and risk-based standard I believe that this is a regulation unnecessary in the state of Tennessee. I believe that some of these businesses that would choose to do this through the ESG scores or whatever should go out of business for a lack of business. And I think that's up to the people. That's up to the people. And anyone that has been deplatformed or debanked, all, you know what? The people can figure that out because word of mouth comes out. People call this radio show. They tell us the story. I'm not... I'm not immune from the horror that would be my life if my bank told me that, no, you're no longer doing bank banking with us. I mean. Well, especially with you because you love banks. You're so into banks. You know how much I enjoy banking. I had a, um, I had a sad and unfortunate incident about two months ago prior to my, uh, my business seminar over in Tunica. I had to actually go inside of a bank as a result of that business seminar. Pay the entry fee to the seminar? Well, I had to go get some cash money, and I was getting cash money along the levels that I didn't want to get 20s. I wanted to get 100s. And I, it was like five of them. Don't Y'all don't, you know. And, uh, and I had to go inside of a bank, which was very traumatic. I broke my streak. I had been like four years. I hate banks, hate banking, but I do not believe that every issue that we come upon in American society needs to be answered with more government. I just don't. I just don't. Fourteen oh six says I'm pretty sure Chase has dumped gun manufacturers and others for political reasons. And I'm, and I'm pretty sure that there are banks available for those gun manufacturers and others to go to. And, and I think that we should stop doing business with Chase because we don't like the way that Chase does business, not because the government lean. If the government can lean in on this, they're going to lean in on other things. If we as a state want them to lean in on this, what do you think they're doing out in California? They're using the same force and power of government against conservatives. Maybe we should say that the government doesn't have this power, nor should it have this power. Whether it's in California and it's liberals doing it to conservatives, or whether it's in Tennessee and it's conservatives doing it to liberals. 
Maybe if we just don't give government this power, the free market will work it out. And, and when you do let government do these things, it suppresses your ability to know who you don't want to do business with. Because you're not going to make the people at, Ch at Chase or Bank of America change their political views and suddenly go, oh, okay, well, we love these guys instead. That's right. Let them show you who they are so you can decide That's right. not to work with them. Because they have enough lawyers and they have enough a big enough legal team. They'll figure out a workaround. I cannot figure out a workaround around this, nor do I want to. We have a short time out. Bill and Mike and Matt and whoever's calling in on line three, we'll get to your calls momentarily. It's Supertalk 99.7 WTN. I spoke with Brink Fiddler earlier this week. Love catching up with Brink, particularly when we have an opportunity to talk and, and there's not a tragedy afoot. Oftentimes we lean on him during these tragic times, and uh, it's just part of what he does on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, I want to tell you what he does in his regular life. Uh, he is owner of Defend Systems. If you're a, a business owner, if you are a churchgoer and you're a decision maker within the church, or perhaps you're a, a part of the decision-making team at a school, any place that people gather, you need to listen up because Defend Systems wants to help you. They are a life safety and security consultation firm based right here in Middle Tennessee. What they do is simple. They come into your facility, they sit down, they talk with you, and they ask you what you want them to talk to your team about, whether it's workplace violence prevention. Uh, active shooter response, emergency and intruder action plans, rapid response medical training, or security improvement consultation. They will customize it all to your facility and to your staff, and they'll do so in a way that makes sense to you and makes sense to your staff. Get trained. I like to say that the likelihood of you having a workplace violence situation break out in your workplace is very, very, very small. It's minuscule, but it's not zero. And that means hope is not a plan. It is time to get trained with Defense Systems. Contact Defense Systems at DefenseSystems.com or give them a call today, 615-236-6484. 236-6484 for Defense Systems.
Super Talk 99.7 WT and Matt Murphy committing to be nice. Nice to be committed. 137-615-737-9986, 615-737-WWTN, an interloper has joined us in studio. He's suspicious. I like I like the hair. I like that. I bet your wife does not like that at all. Yeah. I literally, I, on spring break, stopped back with some family friends in Birmingham, and the they're kind of like grandparent figures to us, and she came out. And Mary said, that's ugly. <laughs> uh, for those who don't know, Cameron Smith is in studio with us, as he is uh, uh, normally on Wednesdays around this time or a little later. Uh, he was not here last week because of spring break. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll ask you about that a little bit later on. Uh, but he is, um, if you're watching on Super Talk TV, you'll see that he is uh, sporting a fetching beard. Mm. And it is, a, it is a demonstration that some people that work at this radio station and are on this radio show from time to time between noon and three can actually grow a good beard. Yeah. Because that's nice. That's full. There could be a bird in that thing. Yeah. I had, a, know. I had a guy wave at me and I'm like, well, I'm driving. And he's like, and roll down your window. Roll down your window. Love your beard, bro. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> what? This just happened. And, I, and in my head, I was like, okay, I'm shaving this thing. I'm not getting handle. <laughs> He was like, love your beard. And I'm like, well, I have gray because I have boys. And he's like, yeah. And that was about the extent of it. But it happened. <laughs> that was the thing in the world. Oh, boy. Hey, are you are you being nice to the big government Republicans, I Tennessee? Am, I am being mean, apparently. And I'm, I'm not trying to be mean, but I am being mean. 1164 says, hey, Matt, you're a little too much in love with yourself today. You complain about the Republicans not being proactive and pushing back when necessary. When they push back, you get out your libertarian flag and protest everything to move. Plus, you were rude to your guest. <sighs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, 1164. I, I, I get it, but the two aren't inconsistent. I mean, when you're basically creating a tool that will be used against conservatives... At some point, it, it's a problem for well, me. I, put it this way. It, and, I, and I think you did it a great service writing about it in the Tennessean, and people can read that. Go to the Tennessean and look up Cameron. He's got an article that dropped today on it. Um, ask yourself if you would support this legislation if it was passed by leftists in California. I'll make it easier for you. Remember that Colorado masterpiece cake baker case? Where the the government in Colorado mm -hmm. said you can't discriminate on this. Yeah, if you bake cakes, you got to bake cakes for yeah, everybody. Everybody, no, you, you don't want to put a same sex wedding cake. You got to do it anyway. And we said, well, that's that's not the government's business, right? That's what stupid. We said. If you hated that law, you should hate this one. I asked um, I asked Representative Zachary about that, and he said that's different because it's a bakery because it's a bakery, and that banks are regulated, and that bakeries are not. And I said. I said, bravo, Sierra. Every business in the state of Tennessee has to beg on bended knee to the government of the state of Tennessee for a business license. Don't tell me that every business is not regulated in so many ways. I mean, you can't count them all. And he said, well, they're not regulated like the banking industry. That's true. And so are you advocating so, and I said, for more? Well, that's what I said. I said, so you're advocating for more regulation. I believe in less regulation, not more regulation in a free market. I like it when you talk like this. Uh, Bill is in Chattanooga. He's been holding for some time. He might want to talk about blood baths. I don't know. Hey, Bill, how are you? Fine. How are you doing? I'm great, Bill. Thank you for calling in, and thank you for holding. No problem. Uh, what I wanted to call about, you were talking with Steve about blood baths. Yes, sir. Uh Webster's Dictionary, the second, uh, number two, you know, the second definition is an economic disaster. So if you look at Webster's, you can find out that that's also what that means, as well as sometimes when you watch uh, the uh, Wall, Wall Street, they will talk about bloodbath if things are going real bad. Yeah, we uh... so you are. After you're absolutely correct, Matt. Well, thank you, Bill. Uh, we we uh we did in the aftermath. I think it was Monday. We played a four minute montage of the same media that clutched their pearls, and 
you know, oh my goodness, he's talking in this language. How can he use this type of language? Donald Trump is saying the words bloodbath. That's so horrible. And we played like a four minute montage. It was put together by, I think, Tom Elliott online in which we demonstrated the number of times the mainstream media has used the word bloodbath in conversation and on their airwaves over and over and over again. I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious what Donald Trump was talking about. So, I mean, he was talking about the economy. I think he wanted to say more broadly the economy was going to be a bloodbath as well. Um, Steve, previous caller, felt like he meant something else. And Steve is a good caller, great listener up in Paris where we want to go. We got to go there. We got to go to Paris. Steve, I tell you what, because I yelled at you on the radio today, when Cameron and I finally get to Paris, we'll buy, I'll have you a delicious slice of pizza waiting for you at mm. where? Where are we going? Aces? Aces is right. I is that right? right? I think yeah. that is correct. Aces pizza, we're told. Oh, we need to get some deep dish up in Paris. Man, great minds, because we're talking about this legislation. We're talking about the bloodbath. I just tweeted out a piece. That I wrote on the bloodbath because, hey, check this out. Am I a huge Donald Trump fan? Uh, you're, you know, I I think, I'll answer the question this well, way. Well, he's no, no Mitt Romney. I mean, yeah, yeah, you're no. I'm no Mitt Romney. Thank you, Bell. <laughs> no, I mean, Trump's not. You mean, you love Mitt. You're not a. So so the answer is just, just generally no. Liz like, Cheney type. I'm like, why are you this way, the way you are? It's kind of. Yeah. I will tell you point blank on this bloodbath thing. This is why people hate the media. Yep. It was so obvious I mean, what he was talking about. And when you lose your credibility because you're like, ooh, he said bloodbath. He said bloodbath. I know. He said bloodbath. Yeah, do you really? I, and I think a lot of Democrats genuinely believe that he was, he, he took an aside from his conversation about automobiles to be like, we're going to kill you all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what is, what is happening, folks? It's the Chinese, the China, they think they're going to do that. And they just ruin the economy. Oh, by the way, we're going to kill every single one of you. We're going to slaughter you. Anyway, back to China. Right. And, and I'm like, I get it. They, I mean, he has foot and mouth disease. Like, I understand that. But in this context, I'm teaching my boys about context clues in reading. Well, you look what's around it to understand what it's about. And the media was just like, actually, let's, let's ignore all the context and just take this little piece. And oh, the Biden campaign was like, Let's do campaign ads, maybe with Nazis. And I'm, what are you doing? Just so goofy. I mean, it, it's so obvious, and you're right. Uh, and it goes back to my two rules of dealing with liberals. They think you're stupid, and they will always overplay their hand because they think you're stupid. Right. And, <laughs> and what, what is happening, and I'll be real specific about what's happening, and I'm, I'm a nerd, so I look at all the polls and everything. Biden is getting crushed with everybody but needle-headed white liberals. That's right. They're like, he actually is so no, much they better. Know, they know they have a problem. Yeah. They're stuck, and they don't know what to do about it. And and thankfully, it, you know, l I use the phrase all the time. It's from the Shakespeare, uh, hoisted by your own petard. A petard is a bomb, uh, and it's an old t school term for a bomb. And so if you're hoisted by your own petard, you lay a bomb, and it blows up on you. And Joe Biden, when he's running for president in 20, whenever it was, 2019, yeah, said, Oh, I'm going to pick a running mate. It's going to be a black female. Meh. And then he looked around and his the limitations that he had placed on himself led him to, to one of the most unlikable political figures in modern times. Mm -hmm. And now they don't know what to do about Joe Biden because they have to leapfrog her. Were you the one that posted the Washington Post piece that was like, hey, Kamala, why don't you <laughs> no, step so much aside? So that's where I was going. So, so much so, the Washington Post. The Washington Post... Came out with an opinion piece begging Kamala Harris to step down because the only way to win the election in 2024 is if she's not a part of it. Yeah. yeah. Because you either win an election by encouraging people to vote for Joe Biden, wink, wink, because, you know, let's say it's Gavin Newsom. Gavin Newsom's really going to be your president, guys. Or you have an ability to... to for Joe Biden to have an accident or whatever it is and not be able to continue to serve as the candidate and then you have a better candidate. And I call balls and strikes on on yeah, Trump. You, like, look, previously I was like, well, he's he really can't win. I've told you on the air, I'm like, well, doing the math, it looks like it's really hard. That's Joe, what you said your I concern did. was, that, yes. that he can't win a general election. And I am, I am changing on that because I'm looking at Joe Biden is so uniquely bad 
Trump's favorability right now has gone up like eight points. It's like 46 percent because Biden's so terrible. Well, and, the, and the reason I say he's hoisted by his own petard, there's no there's no one there to step in and fill the role. Nobody. Right. So normally in normal circumstances, let's say Cameron Smith and Matt Murphy are running together as a ticket and Murph is just so awful. They'd go to Cameron and say, Cameron, we need you to do these events. We need you to kind of fill in here, represent the team. Murph's awful. You're great. But we're going to move it forward. We're going to win this for the team. Right. They can't do that with Kamala Harris because Demo Democratic demographic rules apply. And, 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 and everyone hates her. I mean, I mean, everyone hates her. Yeah. And it's not my fault that yeah. everyone hates her. Which everyone is, hates her. Like, I would be, if I were a Democrat right now, I would be going to Michelle Obama and being like, please, please, we will do anything you want. I think, please. I think that the reasons, and I was always against it, Brian Wilson was too. Brian and I were on the brigade of it's never going to happen with Michelle Obama. And my thing was, she doesn't have the fire in the belly. You have to have the ego and the fire in the belly. She has the ego, but her ego gets fed every day right. of her life. So she doesn't need any more of that. I think it started out of liberal fever dreams where they know how bad this is. And because they do, they're looking for the savior mm -hmm. to swoop in. Well, who's it going to be? Well, it can't be the white patriarchy in the form of Gavin Newsom. So they have to shift to someone else. They know it's not Kamala Harris. So they shift to the other black female that they know is a figure that is well loved. In yeah, and the, the Democrats have lost the middle class. Like, that's the crazy thing here is black and Latino voters are more conservative. They're centrist conservative. And then Democrats, their leadership and their elites, particularly the college educated white folks, are basically like, we are super woke and liberal and all you guys are idiots. And now that's being sort of turned into that's what you really think about us. And then people are just go into Republicans, even though Republicans haven't done a great job, to be like, well, at least you're not telling me I'm stupid. I do not want to count the proverbial chickens. I know. But everything's looking good. And I don't know how they get out of it. Biden's starting to get to get in trouble with suburban women. OK, suburban women fled from Donald Trump. And, and Joe Biden is is losing ground there. Well, because his response is to get angrier and angry. His way of showing that he still has energy is to be angry. Wait a minute. Hold on. Who does that remind me of? <laughs> you. You shut up. What are you talking about in there? Hey, you asked a I'll question on the there. air and I answered it. Shh, throw my boots at you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to get to Matt because he's held for almost an hour. He wants to talk about the national debt. We'll get each of your calls. A lot of you on the line. We'd love to talk to each of you. It's one fifty. Here's Matt in Smyrna. Hey, Matt. Hey, how you doing, uh, Matt? Uh, Matt? I'm doing uh, well, Matt. Sorry. Thank I, you for thank you for I, holding. I, by the way, I apologize it took so long. I, I just got a couple things. Um, <clears throat> first of all, um, your caller Steve. Uh, when when. And it's Donald Trump's fault. Uh, you know, this man, Donald Trump, is is, is a terrible, terrible person to, uh, to articulate as, as on, a, on a presidential level. I mean, he's talking to me like I'm a five-year-old. Um, and I think he's, in essence, he said, well, you guys are too ignorant if, if I raise up my vocabulary. So I think Steve takes that certainly. Um but if you really wanted a bloodbath, I tell you which how you get one. Have China stop sending all their products over here. Have the world stop sending our food in the grocery stores over here. Um, and uh, have all the uh, businesses come back over here because we don't have an infrastructure to service 325 million people. So you would have a bloodbath, and you would have it immediate. So um, I, I just can't. And, and by the way, um, Trump is not going to win the election. Hmm. He doesn't have enough votes. And um, it's the same thing in 2015 when... Who do you... Um, who, hmm? do you who do you think is going to win, Matt? Robert I, F. Kennedy uh, Jr.? No. No, no. Biden's going to win. Biden's, Biden's going Biden. to win. Hmm. Uh, and you didn't mention the five cities that were getting the um, the chip, the, 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 the uh, what do they call it, semiconductor chip, how they're going to have Hundreds and hundreds of jobs in uh, Oregon, 
New Mexico, uh, Ohio. You didn't mention that. So, so Biden, before becoming president, won in 2000 by the by the skin of his teeth, by the slimmest of margins. It was, you know, just a, a few votes in Pennsylvania. Um, I think 50,000 votes in Wisconsin, something like that. Um, mm-hmm. Other than that, you would see Donald Trump. So what do you believe Joe Biden, and, and I'm limited on time, but I, I want, I'm, this is very, I'm very curious. What do you believe Joe Biden has done, maybe one or two things in his time as president that has galvanized the support around him to the point that he's going to easily win re-election. What would you, can uh, you just point to one or two things for me? Uh, Donald, Donald Trump's conduct. Okay, so that's that's non-responsive Donald to the question asked. So I'm going to ask the question no, no, again. No, no. What has Joe Biden oh. done? Not Donald Trump. Let's not talk about Donald Trump for a minute. What has right. Joe Biden done that has galvanized the support of Joe Biden? That's going to make people enthusiastic. To go out and vote for Joe. As president, what has he done? Okay. So, to answer your question, I think that, A, our stock market has gone crazy right now. We have made money. We have made money in the stock market. Okay. And, two, and two, we don't have all of these um, issues of how to, how to act in a childish manner. Um, and we, we can foresee. If you think we're in debt now. If Trump gets back in, what, is this a revenge tour? I mean, how much of the American dollars are we going to spend in court cases and legal cases? I mean, it's just going to be chaos. And, and let me tell you something, too. Uh, Donald, Trump, Donald Trump is airing out. Um, um, it only, by the way, it, it, only, it, only took, it, only, it only took 42 seconds to get back to Donald Trump. 42 but it, for you. But it's, it's, but it's relevant because there's only... Well, it's not relevant, relevant to the question I asked. But, Matt, keep calling. Keep engaging. I love this. I love it. I'm, I'm, I'm up against it. Uh, Bell's yelling at me right now. But please call you. me back and, and let's continue to engage. I really do appreciate the conversation and I want to continue it. But I cannot right now because I have to do this. You know, I, I told the people over at Craft Body Scan, I said, I got to spell it out every time I talk about you. And they said, why do you have to spell it out? And I said, I have to spell it out because people are going to think to spell it with a K. And it's not with a K, it's with a C. And they said, nah, people won't think that. And I said, yes, they will. And they said, no, they won't. We argued about it a little while. Now I'm going to spell it out. CraftBodyScan.com. Spell it with a C. When you go to the website, CraftBodyScan.com. C-R-A-F-T BodyScan.com. For $149, you and a loved one, a spouse, a brother, a sister, whatever it might be, someone important in your life. Heck, I might even take Bell K and get him a heart and lung scan from Craft Body Scan. Me and him, $149. They'll scan it. They'll check it out. They'll give you the results. Uh, it, do- it doesn't take but about eight minutes to do the scan. There's an initial consultation. You don't have to take your clothes off or anything like that. Uh, that's it's none of that. It's a CT scan that checks out your body inside and gives you peace of mind, and you find out if anything's going on, and you find out if anything's not going on, which is kind of nice. CraftBodyScan.com. Spell it with a C or give them a call at 615-436-1000.
201. I'm Mac Morey with your top stories. Currently 69 degrees and sunny on Music Row. Got a weather forecast coming up in two minutes. The Federal Reserve today keeping interest rates right where they are again, but it's unclear if the Fed will start lowering them anytime soon. Andy Field with details. Interest rates are much like a fire hose. The Fed raises them high enough to douse an inflation fire, which is what they think they did earlier last year and the year before. And the reason why the Federal Reserve is keeping rates the same five and a quarter to five and a half percent right where they've been since last July. The Fed saying the economy is still growing and unemployment still low, so no changes up or down for now. Back here in Tennessee with a Riley Strain update, the search for the missing 22-year-old college student has now moved from the banks of the Cumberland River to the Cheatham Dam in Ashland City. It's about 42 miles downstream from Nashville. Strain's been missing since March 8th. The University of Missouri student was in Nashville for a fraternity trip and disappeared after getting kicked out of a bar. Metro search crews are still searching in the Cumberland River as well. And in Southern California, police are joining forces with federal prosecutors to put gun crime suspects in prison. Here's Alex Stone. Police from around Southern California are teaming up with the U.S. attorney for federal prosecutors to take on more gun crimes in the region, especially those involving robberies, extortion, and kidnapping. It's being called Operation Safe Cities, and U.S. attorney Martina Estrada says under federal law, suspects can face quite a bit of prison time if convicted. Those individuals who commit these crimes face a maximum sentence of 20 years. A team of federal prosecutors will work to identify cases. And that is the latest news. Got a weather forecast next. I'm Mac Morey, WTN News. Hello, friends. It's Matt Murphy, and I want to speak to you for a moment about the Tennessee Men's Clinic and what they can do for you. The Tennessee Men's Clinic has been around first since 2014. Evan Bass started the clinic because he wanted to give men a place to go for men-specific issues that you deal with in your daily life. Now, obviously, these issues deal with things like testosterone and what happens over the course of your life with your T-levels in your body. Uh, They deal with energy levels. They deal with uh, ways that that manifests itself, whether it's not wanting to go to the gym and keep up with your workouts or or even, in some cases, um, losing a desire or a drive in the bedroom, for example. Now, I know that they talk about that on their commercials, and rightly so, because it's a big deal. Uh, 50% of men listening to me will have some sort of issue. It's why they employ urologists. It's why they have trained urologists that are ready 
to look over you, to check you out, to uh, get some blood work done and find out what's going on in your body and get you to a solution, which is what you're looking for. Get back to energy again. Get back to that level of energy that you enjoyed years ago. Don't wait another day. Most men wait way too long before they make this call to the Tennessee Men's Clinic. Two locations to serve you. One's in Cool Springs, the other in Midtown. TennesseeMensClinic.com, TennesseeMensClinic.com, or 615-208-9090. 208-9090 for Tennessee Men's Clinic. There is currently an immigration rally, or at least there was moments ago, an immigration rally happening on the steps of the Tennessee State Capitol. We're hoping to get a report from Representative Jody Barrett, who I believe was there and spoke in person regarding what can and cannot be done in the state of Tennessee. Look, I'm all about doing everything we possibly can. And if that is if that rises to the level of challenging certain court cases that have been galvanized, uh, into the American fabric, so be it. Uh, and some of the things that were being discussed an hour or so ago on the steps of the Tennessee Capitol would require going to court, battling the federal government. It, whose job is it? Is it the states? Is it the federal government with regard to immigration? Well, I think it's high time that we had those battles. Uh, sadly, I don't want to. I wish that the federal government would follow their own rules, but under the Biden administration, they're not doing so. We'll catch you up to date with what's going on over at the Capitol coming up in just a couple of minutes. Uh, we've got plenty of your telephone calls as well. It's been a lively first two hours, and we'll keep it going with Cameron Smith of the Tennessean. He has written a, a you know what, some of your columns, some of your columns, just absolute trash. Thank you. <laughs> I'm not surprised at all. I just, Cameron and I are good enough. <laughs> Cameron and I are good enough friends that I can do that just to get the look on his face. You know, but this one, this one, you are right on point, my friend. Thank you. I love it. So you, uh, you actually deserve a little bit of credit because you called my attention to this issue on social media, on the X machine. And I kind of had a, a little bit of a back and forth with uh, Jason Gra Zachary, the bill's sponsor, and he was willing to come on the show earlier. I want you to give me your analysis, your take on this, and then I want to play a little clip from earlier today, what Jason Zachary said about who this would affect and who it would not affect. What, what's your overall take on this? And I've read the piece. I know what it is, but share yeah, it with the I, audience. I'll make the summary real easy. This HB 2100 uh, that passed out of the House says for banker, bank, banks and insurers – it, they can't discriminate in their offering of services. And that, okay, people, like, that sounds reasonable enough, but it's based on political opinions um, and a host. It's a, literally a laundry list of all these different criteria. The problem is they're neutral and could apply to conservatives and liberals alike. The idea was, well, let's get the woke stuff out of banking and insurance. I get that. I understand that. However, it will also simultaneously get the conservative and libertarian stuff out of this, which to me is none of the government's business. The government is not here to engage in viewpoint discrimination. And I pull in Citizens United and say, look, corporations don't lose their speech rights because they're corporations, because they're made of individuals, right? And the courts talked about that. And then the idea that Tennessee legislators could create a situation where a more conservative bank who that say the the founders of the bank are pro life would be forced as a matter of law to issue loans to a pro choice organization and I, for me I'm like that's a decision they should make it's not a protected class like leave it up to them uh, one of the things that I don't care for is the idea that we're picking which banks this applies to and which banks it doesn't apply to I brought up the example to Jason Zachary earlier in the day uh, uh, that you bring up regarding the cake baker. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, that's different. Uh, we regulate banks. We, uh, and I was like, well, what are you talking about? You regulate cake bakers too. Uh, you just don't regulate them as much. Well, right. uh, well, so you want a, more regulation on the banks. But, but, but uh, be that as it may, uh, he says, no, no, that's very different. The state of Tennessee looks into these things differently. My, my concern is just what you stated, that, uh, that if this were happening in a blue state, 
if this were happening in an Oregon or a Washington state, I would call this government overreach. I would say this is none of your Absolutely. business because undoubtedly the liberals would be going after conservative organizations yes. in this legislation. So if it's not the government's job then, then I have to ask myself if it's the government's job now. And I use, and a lot of you have told me about the old Phil Valentine model. And it's a, it's a tried and true test that government is there to do those things that the private sector cannot do on its own. Right. Can the private sector work this out on its own? Absolutely it can. And you know what? It might take a little more attention on some of these organizations that are doing things that we as a state don't care for. Well, so be it. Let's and call I'll, those I'll give out. You a perfect example. When everybody's afraid of Amazon taking folks offline, right? When they were, oh, well, you're going to take my political viewpoints and you're going to undercut me. You know what happened? I had people approach me and say, well, hey, look, we got a server farm that's idle over here. We think that we can be a data hub that, you know, doesn't discriminate on that stuff. Wow. Yep. That's the free market About working. It. I didn't need the government to say, you know, we should go punch Amazon in the throat. I'll give you another example from a social media perspective. Uh, and it, it worked out a little bit differently, but the free market worked it out. Twitter. Mm -hmm. Right. Twitter was a social media company that was putting its thumb on the scale and people recognized it and hated it. And so they started gravitating to other platforms. Parler was one of them and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And then eventually Truth Social was created and Truth Social still exists. It's not on the level of Twitter. But what did the free market do? The free market pressed that they, they, they pressed that issue to the point that someone stepped up and said, wait a minute, there's a buying opportunity here. And that person was named Elon Musk. Yeah. And he said, if I, people love this platform. People love this, but they hate what it's become. If I buy the platform and return it to what they wanted to begin with, that's a money-making operation for me, and which is what he's done. So, and, and he values free speech and a lack of censorship above all else. As was illustrated, did you see the did you see the exchange between him and Don Lemon? Mm -mm. Oh, oh, the, about him getting kicked off. Well, he was going to hire Lemon, right? And then they did. Hit, Lemon's first interview was going to be Elon Musk, and it went so badly. And Elon Musk got such an insight into who Don Lemon was, he rescinded the contract. Yeah, because he apparently asked for a cyber truck and all kinds of other stuff too. And it was like, dude, you're look, you're looking for another opportunity. I would kind of. Put it back in a little bit. Well, but then uh, it got to the point where Lemon was pressing, but there's hate speech on your platform. And he was like, yeah, but we don't promote it. You know, we we we, we don't elevate it. We do everything we can to uh, to keep it over here in the corners, but we're not going to censor it. That's not our there's role. free speech. Right. And, and this, to me, is the crux of the issue right here with Representative Zachary's bill is it is – rigging the game to get an outcome with a heavy hand of government. And that heavy hand, you like it when it's used against your opponents. You hate it when it's used against you. It's the same hand. Mm -hmm. And and you got to be real careful about that. A another amusing example, one that I brought up about a week ago, was uh, the RuPaul deal. Mm. So RuPaul, the drag performer or whatever, uh, was a part of a group that created a book club. A bookseller, an online bookseller. I think it's called Astoria or Allstoria. And the mission statement when they launched the company was that there's too much book banning going on in the United States of America. And all of this book banning, book banning, book banning. And we're not we're not limiting any book. There, this is a place for everyone to sell sure. their wares. It lasted three days before they banned Matt Walsh. <laughs> they banned. I mean, all of the Ben Shapiro, all of the typical conservatives got banned because people lashed out. And it's like, oh, it's a little bit different when it's on your platform or when it's in your. Uh, it's just it's amazing to me how much people claim that they value free speech until people start saying things that they don't like. And then they want someone else to shut them up for them. You know, and I said, I, it depends on me, hey, me protecting the haters, the losers and the woke weirdos because I want to be free, too. And so this stuff and this kind of garbage, and I'll say it's garbage. And I don't, I don't think the fears of being debanked or dropped from insurance coverage, coverage are illegitimate. I'm simply saying that we got to respect the Constitution. We got to respect civil liberties. And I, I want to be free, and I don't need a government nanny fixing it for me. Cameron Smith is with us. We'll play you some of that clip from Jason Zachary coming up in just a moment. But many of you have been holding for some time, and I appreciate your patience. Let's get to Eric, who's in Jasper. All it says, Eric, is that you want to talk about beards. So you you're go to picking the, on camera. 
you're picking on Cameron about his beard. Cameron, do me a favor. Go to Facebook. Look at Matt Murphy's uh, Facebook page. Back during the pandemic, he looks like Grizzly Adams. Yeah, I did get pretty. I, I remember. Oh, I did get pretty Lord. crazy. Heal thyself, yeah, I, I, doctor. Matt, Matt has never been able to hurt my feelings. We've been friends a very long time. I've so tried too. Eric. He tries. I try all the time. I've, I've been listening to Matt since, at least the Andre Lindenberg. Um, we've been. I've been listening to Matt when he was down there in Birmingham. I, I live down there in Jasper, Alabama, and I've been picking on Matt for years. That's fair. <laughs> he probably deserves it. Every bit of it. Mm -hmm. Every bit. Yeah, of but. It. But like, and by the way, when you mentioned uh, somebody, you know, the, the liberals twisting and about their uh, pearls and everything, you're talking about Don Lemon, weren't you? Don <laughs> Lemon. Yes, <laughs> I was. We were talking about his pearls. <laughs> yeah. Mm, uncomfortable. I got it just before you did, by the way. <laughs> just before you did. Thank you, Eric, for the call. Yes, I know it's true. I admit my jealousy oftentimes manifest itself with some sort of righteous anger or indignation or humor. And any comment that I make about Cameron's beard and its lack of focus, mm. form, <laughs> is all bathed in jealousy because it tries I might. If I grow it longer, it looks fuller, but it's never, I mean, it, it's just not. I, I have too much Cherokee Indian in me. And I cannot grow a full beard. I wish I, that I could. Uh, and I keep facial hair only because I am lazy. That's really interesting. I can't think of any Cherokee people I know that have big beards. No. We, huh. can't, we can't grow them. Interesting. Largely a hairless peoples. All right. Roll well Tide. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, you said it, buddy. <laughs> James is in Brentwood. Hey, James, how are you? Hey, James, how are you? Doing well, Matt. Hey, I just was wanting to call to like just say kudos on calling that guy out because he is actually. Mm -hmm. They lost you, bud. Those are the most poignant words ever spoken. Man, oh man! I hope everyone just heard what Jason had to say. I mean, James had to say. I, I think we need to spend a moment mm -hmm. reflecting on what he just said. There. Moment of silence, because that, my friend, that meant something. All the best words. All the best words. I'll hold. I'll put you on hold there, uh, James. You're in a weird place, uh, and I'm going to try to get back to you. Mike is in Tullahoma with a thought on banking. Hello, Mike. Yes, yeah, sir. Hey, how you doing, buddy? Good. Um, let me uh, throw this at you. I go all the way back listening to this station when it was uh, Dave Ramsey uh, and Roy Matlock and the Money Game and that sports show. But uh, there's, uh, as far as uh, you listening to you since you came on board. I'm a junk, uh, talk show junkie, and two of my favorites over the years kind of have your anger and passion. Um, I don't listen to them anymore, but Michael Savage and then Mark Levin. Uh, one thing about us, when we get on topic and uh, the passion's there, the voice does go up a little bit. You're, all the listeners just going to have to understand that a little bit. <laughs> So you just keep that up, okay? Well, Mike, I'd like to thank you, my friend, for saying this kind <laughs> well, words. You're very nice. Anyways, I'm not. I'm not. It's just. It's just part of your nature, and it's hard for people to understand. But you got. You brought a lot of facts. You and you and uh, Brian, when you came on board, both of you, you all brought a lot of facts that had been kind of sliding since Phil's days. Uh, oh. You know, Johnny B. He can. He knows a lot of facts too, and gets them out there. I love it when Johnny gets going. But anyways, what I called on was this banking thing. Um, the I listen to a lot of radio international and stuff, and one of the top radio hosts, I guess, in the entire United Kingdom, uh, evidently has been around forever and very famous. And about a year ago, I started listening to him, and they just completely, this guy had businesses on the side and everything. And the radio station is a conservative. It's uh, GBN, I guess, out of London. And overnight, that dude was out of business. He went to like 17 different banks and still couldn't get back in the banking world. Um, I guess he's got it figured out now. But overnight, his entire switch was turned off. And over the last year, the U.K. has been talking about doing some kind of these regulations, too. 
uh, and it kind of strikes like the media is in this country. If, you know, if you're on one side, everything's cool, but, you know, money is so big. Uh, I don't know if little guys like you and me could ever get around it. You know, Elon Musk can get around it because he got money to float on. But um, if, if they turn off my bank tomorrow, you know, I don't know what I'd do. I don't know where I'd go. And I, I think that's well. I mean, I, I I do not believe. I, I, I do not believe. I, I think the government involves itself far too much oh, uh, in our financial institutions. But you know, anywhere that there's a lot of money flowing around. Uh, not only is the government going to gravitate to that because they want their cut of the pie, they they also have a legitimate purpose to making sure that everything's on the up and up, uh, that nobody is taking advantage of anybody else. So I, I fully understand that. Uh, but I think they have their hands a little too far into that regulatory pie, so to speak. Yeah, I think what's happening, and, you know, we're seeing it, it just happens to be in the conservative states right now with backbones, Florida and Texas and Tennessee and you know, the other states that are that are trying to make sure that, you know, the, the law is not just walked on them. You know, you and I are living now in, a, in an area where we never dreamed of. A lot of times I'll get in trouble on Facebook. I'll just make a post to friends. I'll just say, you know, Lady Justice is dead. And, you know, some will say, what do you mean by that? And I say, you, just, you know, look around. I mean, if you can't, in the banking world, if you can't trace the millions that have gone to one family that's sitting at the head of this country right now, figurehead, if they can't trace that into the bank account, how in the world can they audit um, a body shop in Tullahoma that the guy put, you know, store-bought Cokes in a sundrop machine and they made him pay tax on that in an audit? I mean, you know these guys know where the money is um, when it comes to Lady Justice. Uh, but the banks, the banks are so big they are using this stuff to leverage against uh, people. Well, and I mean, uh, yeah, and, and, and it, 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 it's a much, lo and thank you, Mike, for the call. Thank you for the kind words. My takeaway from Mike's telephone call was that you get facts on this radio show. If you want fact-free analysis, Dan Mandis, Nash, no, that's, I'm kidding. That's a I heard joke. something like that. I though. did. I yeah. thought so too. Um, afternoons are where you find the facts, fact-free, anecdotally, the mornings, from 5 until noon on Super Talk 99.7. Fact free. That's what I'm told. Anecdotally. I'm just doing that for Mac Mori. <laughs> for his, I'm just doing that for Anecdotally him. speaking. Anec <laughs> um, you know, my anger, and it's not really anger. My frustration uh, with the banking industry largely is that I mean, we've created this dynamic in our lifetimes, and I mean, I could go back to the Federal Reserve. I could go back to auditing the Federal Reserve, and it, I mean, I don't want to get too deep into those weeds, but um, the banks have become as big as they are because the banks are too big to fail. Right. Remember that? Remember that? I've got Jody Barrett on Twitter saying what you were told, It's and I like Jody. It's limited to non-lending decisions for banks with assets over $100 billion. There are no Tennessee-based banks that meet that threshold. Well, then what's... Then what are you doing? What are you doing? Jody they're, they're, is also they're... downstairs, and we need to go to break. Oh. <laughs> hey, Jody's, Jody's coming for you, pal. We'll talk to Jody about that in just a moment. Super Talk 99.7 WG. The world-famous Glock, the Glock store is out there, and the Glock store wants to see you. I'm telling you, folks, I love this place. I go in often. I train on a K. I need to get back, actually. I need to get to the Shoot 270 rooms. I need to get with the guys at the Glock store, and I need to sign myself up for another training session. You know, we had a great session where I did some shooting, I did some target drills, and then everyone came in and tried to match my target practice. And I had a little bit of an advantage because I had about an hour-long session uh, with uh, Dan, one of the incredible trainers over at Shoot270.com. Anyway, I want you to go by and see the rooms. They don't train in lanes. They train in rooms. And they train in rooms for a reason, because your life happens exterior to these lanes. It, uh, it is as simple as this, folks. Go to Shoot270.com, the website, Shoot270.com, and see 
the Glock store difference. Or go by and see the incredible showroom space, the incredible people, the retail side, the manufacturing side at the Glock store. Lindy McGill's Glock store located on Air Lane Drive just off of Elm Hill Pike. Tell them Matt Murphy sent you to the one and only the Glock store. Additional sentencings of former Mississippi sheriff's deputies convicted of torturing two black men and some possible legislation here in Tennessee. We'll talk about it at 2.30. Super Talk 99.7 WTN. Mere seconds before. Did you hear that tease, that pro tease? From Double M over there in the newsroom, in the news closet? You know it's what I do. We are mere seconds away from that newscast on Super Talk 99.7 WTN. We're also mere seconds away from a conversation with our good friend, Representative Jody Barrett, who's fresh off of the immigration rally at the Tennessee State Capitol. Right now, I promised that I'd get to as many as I could. Gary's in Centerville. Gary, thank you for your call. How are you? Hey, Matt. I'm doing great. Good to hear from you, buddy. Well, it's good to hear from you, Gary. What's on your mind? All right, uh, you asked that one about what Joe Biden has done. Do you remember that? Uh, my question to my my question for the the caller about Joe yeah, Biden. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. Uh, he could not answer you because he's really done nothing. What he's done for this country is destroy it. <laughs> he shut down the pipelines. He stopped all the drilling. He's put this country in chaos. You know, I don't understand, Matt. Uh, these people see what he's done, and they still vote for Joe Biden. Uh, either they're crazy or insane at the best. And they keep running Donald Trump down. It, you know, he ain't done nothing compared to what they've done. I don't understand it. Can you give me an insight on that? Help me out on this. Yeah, I, I can't. I think I can. What I'm going to do, I'm going to say goodbye to you on the phone line. So goodbye to you on the phone lines. I'm going to go to Mac Morey's newscast. And when we come back, we're going to talk to Jody. And maybe Jody and Cameron can help me out with this question. 
Um, you know, some call it Trump derangement syndrome. Uh, some are just so dug in. What I've noticed is uh, that people don't really defend Joe Biden so much as they turn it around and they go right toward Donald Trump and they start talking about Donald Trump's failures or Donald Trump's shortcomings uh, because they don't have a lot to lean on with Joe Biden. It's the reason the polls are shifting decidedly toward Trump, especially in the swing states, is because there's really no there there when it comes to Biden's presidency. It's 231 Super Talk 997 WTN. Time for the news. Thirty-two minutes after the hour of two o'clock, I'm Mac Morey with your top stories. Currently, seventy-one degrees, warmed up a little bit since these last couple of days. Sun flying high in Music City on the first official full day of spring. Got a forecast on the way in two minutes. Additional sentencings of former Mississippi sheriff's deputies convicted of torturing two black men. Derek Dennis fills us in. The latest sentencings of former Mississippi sheriff's deputies Christian Dedman and Daniel Updike spell decades in prison for the two in the assault and torture of two black men, Michael Jenkins and Eddie Parker, last year. Updike getting 17 and a half years for carrying out a mock execution, putting his gun in Jenkins' mouth and pulling the trigger, but the shooting failed. In court, he apologized to Jenkins, saying the weight of my actions and the harm I've caused will haunt him every day. Dedman and Updike, among six white former officers known as the Goon Squad, being sentenced this week to between 17 and 20 years in prison in the case. Right now in Tennessee, lawmakers in the Senate Education Committee will hear arguments for a bill that would allow students a day off of school for civic engagement. News Channel 5 says the organization Students for Education came up with the idea. Students would need a permission slip from a parent and write a one-page paper on what they learned afterwards. That's to keep kids from using the day simply to skip classes. And that's the latest news. Weather's next. I'm Mac Morey, WTN News. I was making this morning in my kitchen a couple of eggs. I put some mushrooms and broccoli in there. It's a very, very low calorie. It's like 200 calorie breakfast. But anyway, uh, the reason that I'm able to gobble that down is because of savory spice. I mean, sincerely, uh, I use some of their incredible spice blends. I actually used the Mexican street corn blend in my eggs, broccoli, and mushrooms this morning. And it was absolutely fabulous. A little hot sauce on there, and it's good to go. Without that savory spice, it's... I mean, it's just no good. With the savory spice, it's delicious. I mean, spice makes all the difference, right? It is the reason that we say the spice of life. Savory spice is up in your spice game. Get off the grocery store aisle and get to savory spice to see the difference. You will see the difference in the various salts. They have international blends and international flavors. They have something for every palate and every taste. And if you're a newbie in the kitchen, they can help walk you through the spices you need, the things you don't need. They can even sell you blends that are available for you. You just you put them in the crock pot, put all of those spices is in the crock pot with a piece of meat and eight hours later you have a delicious meal it's just that simple savory spice two locations one's lnl market just off of charlotte pike the other's in franklin just off the square tell holly and david that i sent you to savory spice yep your food game by being your spice game yep your spice game it's savory spice
I love, love, love what I do. I really do. I hope that you enjoy it as well. I am passionate. Sometimes I'm your pit bull. Sometimes I'm the pit bull on your leg. Regardless, I enjoy what I do, and I thank you for being a part of it on a day-to-day basis. Thank you so much. Cameron Smith is with us in studio. He has moved it down the line. Mm -hmm. It's like I'm um, Johnny Carson. I was going to say, watch as I compare myself to one of the most famous entertainers of all time. It's like I'm Johnny Carson, and you're Ed McMahon. Yeah. Well, and I, and I stepped aside, and I, you know, I even got him set up. I don't know what kind of operation you're running here. He didn't have ears. Like, <laughs> I'm not running an operation where my Ed's going to take care of business <laughs> over there. Uh, Representative Jody Barrett joins us in studio. What's up, Jody? Hey, what's going on, man? I was thinking you? more like Andy and and uh, Conan. Conan. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Fair. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, Jody basically calling us old. That's fine. That's fine. His <laughs> dated. Re- There's a dated, reason for dated that. Dated reference Matt. lost on younger listeners. As long as we don't talk about what you're doing on my leg, we're good. Uh, <laughs> oh, pit that's pit bulling. Uh, uh, today, uh, you were a part of, uh, I think, a good exercise in. Uh, the First Amendment and a good voice of the people, an effort to express to the General Assembly, we want you to do everything you possibly can uh, to stop what the federal government isn't. Talk to us about it. Sure. It was a great, uh, great event. Beautiful day for it, too. Uh, probably a little more than 100 people there, I think. Uh, very vocal and, and supportive. Put on by Brandon Lewis and the Tennessee Conservative News. And uh, it was really good to have, I think we had nine or ten uh, speakers coming up maybe 10 minutes at a time, rotating through as we all kind of coming in and out of committee. Mm -hmm. Um, And the crowd was fired up, man. They were ready to go. What do you believe, I mean, of their goals, you know, there are some things that are immediately going to be dumped into a court, right? Sure. Because the feds, especially under Biden, you know, if some of the goals as stated by Brandon, and I've had him on the show, and I appreciate him, and I appreciate trying to move the ball in a direction where we get some sanity back in our immigration process. Uh, but what do you think, if anything, is achievable by the General Assembly, if not in this session, in the next session? Well, look, I think the from my standpoint and as a member of the General Assembly, what we have to do is, is isolate what we can control and can't control. Obviously, there are things in federal law and, and uh, the, way, the way the Constitution is written and, and Supreme Court cases that limit what we can do at the state level. So – Push those aside. Let's not fight battles that we can't win, and let's focus on what we can do. And so we've had a lot of good pieces of legislation come up. You were talking about Rusty Grills' uh, bill that got passed earlier this week. Um, I had a resolution on the floor that uh, this Monday night. So, you know, there's a lot of things that we're trying to do to kind of just continue the conversation and push the conversation so that we can keep peeling back the, the layers of the onion. And, and from my pers- position, my approach is – the things that we can control is the the policies of the state that make Tennessee a magnet. We have to demagnetize Tennessee to where these folks would rather go somewhere else. They'd rather go to the West Coast or the mm. Northeast or something like that. On the um, uh, one of the pieces that I appreciate the and I don't know what the specific language and I'm not putting you on the spot. If you don't know, we can sure. get back to it. But on E Verify, I think the threshold is thirty or thirty five employees or something like that right now, and. I, I don't know what sort of burden it would create on small business owners to go ahead and do that because what what I think what's happening right now, if this is our focus, what happens right now is the larger businesses use subs and the subs have less than 35 and right. they don't do the checking. And so legitimately, the larger businesses will call up Matt Murphy and say, man, I, I'm doing what the law tells me to do. And oh, by the way, I can't do anymore. I'm not legally allowed to go to an employee of my subcontractor and demand paperwork, that's their job. So is there a way to repair some of that? There is, and I actually had a bill, unfortunately, that did not come through Senate, but was moving on the House side that that addressed driver's licenses that we issue in Tennessee, temporary licenses that are issued to non-U.S. citizens. Originally, I was trying to redesign that license so it would make it more readily apparent. We do issue them now that just has a, an X designation, so law enforcement kind of knows to look for it, but nobody else does. So I wanted to re- redesign it so on its face it would be easily uh, um, ascertainable from somebody at a quick glance that you're dealing with somebody that's not a citizen. That kind of got pushed aside, but we worked out a, a – hmm. we worked out. I a, like that idea. Well, it's it's great. The they, licenses could be in the shape of their country of origin. <laughs> well, what we what we came back to is 
right now those Shirley under the law, wouldn't fit in your wallet. No, under, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I know, I'll right? Shut, shut focus, up. Matt. Focus. <laughs> So what we're trying to do is right now under the law, those licenses are issued for up to eight years. So my bill would have reduced that to two years. Mm-hmm. So every two years, they would have had to come back in, re- recheck in, update their address, photo the whole nine yards. So there, we had some pushback from some groups, obviously, that thought that was going to be unfair, or too, too burdensome for folks to do that. But here's, the, here's the where the rubber meets the road. 80% of business-related visas that are issued – are issued for two years at a time. There's a reason we chose that number. And so you've got the business-related visas, people that are here on six-month right. uh, vacations. You have student visas, the whole nine yards. So you start digging into that. We, we had 850,000 overstays in 22 alone. Now, these are – when you talk about licensing – uh, because the the super tax line just blew up, members nutrition super tax line. Why can they get? Li- I mean, you're talking about people that come initially legally under the law in Tennessee. If they have, if they are here for a federally authorized purpose or period of time, they can apply for a temporary driver's license in Tennessee. Yeah. And in Tennessee, and I found this out when I got a license, and I loved it. It's an eight year licensing, mm-hmm. which I love because the Tennessee's not coming at me for more money every four years, uh, but. The same standard applies for those folks, and you wanted to change that standard. Why, why in the heck didn't they support that in the Senate? We, we worked together with the Department of Safety, who got on board with the idea of, of cutting the time, and both of my uh, camp, or committee chairmen were on board, too. It was moving, sailing through in the House, but like I said, on the Senate side, they operate a little bit differently over there, and uh, they were getting some stuff in the other ear that they didn't like. And so, unfortunately, I didn't get a chance we to— We got to call Jack. Yeah, I didn't get a chance to combat that. But this this is a thing that I'll bring back next year. I think it's vital to us to be able to continue. We don't have a way of tracking these folks. Did you move it to one year or? Two years. So two years makes sense to me because it maps. It, it maps with the people that are here to work at, at Nissan or Volkswagen or wherever. They're here for on a two-year work. Right, and, when they anyway. re-up, and if they have to re-up their visa every couple of years, if they're going to stay, then go ahead and re-up that are you, you are you aware of the 287G program at the federal yes. level? Yes. How does Tennessee interact with that? You know, that's that's a it's a wonky thing that probably we don't have enough time right, to get right. into, but uh, you know, there's a lot of inner moving parts there and this was not affecting the 287G. Okay. Part. Well, the 287G for the listeners that don't know is basically a state can enter a memorandum of understanding with the federal government, which the Biden administration is sort of reluctant on this stuff, to essentially enforce federal law, which gets you around the supremacy clause problem. So if Tennessee enacts tough immigration laws, Alabama ran into the same problem, then under the supremacy clause, DOJ can come in, strike it down and say, no, we got field preemption here. We run immigration, not you. Well, the 287G goes around that. And it's the federal government saying, we will enter into a partnership with you. So when you pull over somebody that's overstayed a visa, you can detain them and then turn them over to us for deportation. That's the kind of stuff we need to be doing and enforcing the federal government to tell us no. And that coincides with, with Representative Grill's bill that he was doing that was was requiring law enforcement to report to federal authorities right. whenever they run into those folks. I want to clean this up. Um, ask him how it is we're giving illegal aliens drivers licenses. I don't think that's what you're talking about, but this person says it's happening. Those are people that are working exterior to the law right i mean the law does not permit i mean but if they have certain paperwork some people are going to slip through the cracks right so the law in tennessee does not currently allow for illegal aliens to get a driver's license however the the the, you get into semantics and what the law says is that if you're here for a federally authorized purpose or period of time so we know that the folks are coming across the border right now that are going, claiming asylum. going straight to the Border Patrol, claiming mm-hmm. asylum, getting paperwork that, that gives so them— So that paperwork— Potentially— Handcuffs Tennessee? And then that gets them into the country for a federally authorized purpose for a period of time. And then in that interim, their status changes. And so they're still here illegally waiting for their status to be determined. But that may—and that's what I'm trying to get sort through with the Department of Safety here in Tennessee is whether or not that purpose— is federally authorized and meets the threshold of the statute for them to get a, a driver's license. I feel Tennessee. like a Trump presidency would solve a lot of this. Well, I mean, just dealing with the asylum issue, that that bill that everyone hated, the mm-hmm. immigration one that Langford did, actually addressed this question and made the asylum proceedings real short. 
And that would work out well with the two year thing because right now those asylum claims can take like six years. And here's six what I here's years, what yeah. I would prefer to do. I would prefer the federal government shut all asylum claims down for a period of one year. Sure. I mean, there's. I mean, and I I'm yet I've yet to hear. I mean, I understand from a humanitarian standpoint. Yeah, it's we don't want purely wanna, humanitarian. I understand that, but what? forces the United States of America to accept asylum seekers. Nothing. Nothing. And it has gotten so out of control with the Biden administration. I think it's time for a grand reset. Just wait what's what about what's happened what is about to happen with Haiti? Like oh, no. you're seeing it in Florida. It's, well, and they, and they don't know what they're going to do if boats of people come over here. They have no idea what they're And they do have legitimate them. asylum claims because they had gangs taking over the government. <laughs> With like, machetes. We're afraid right. for our lives. Right. I mean, well, this and, is going to happen. And speaking of boats, just that visualization, that part of the issue, if you think of it, of a safety or, or an escape boat on a, a cruise ship, it can only hold so many people before it becomes dangerous for the, those people, for that boat. I mean, it's going to sink or... or capsize if you put too many people in it so same thing with the asylum process we're getting we're, we're far beyond yeah, that boat point. is america correct that's what i'm getting at we are the boat and our boat is be, is taking on water because I mean, we're taking in too many people you could, because you know where our life we don't have a lifeboat that's correct we there are, is no we other are life, the we lifeboat. are the lifeboat there is no other lifeboat. australia <laughs> new zealand well the, the problem on the, the immigration claims i'm yeah, telling you the asylum issue i'm all about humanitarian stuff but we should be able to discern these real fast you know you can't just say asylum you have to have evidence of legitimate fear and if you're coming from a country where that doesn't exist we should be able to see that right and, the, and 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 a va- i mean there are some that are legit but the right. vast majority of people that are saying that have learned they've been told just say this this and this mm-hmm. and they'll give you a piece of paper and you won't see them again right and we should not do that no jody yeah. barrett we appreciate you well, thanks thank for you having for, me thank you for stomping by cameron I appreciate you a little less than Jody, but I still appreciate you. Simon. Totally fair. <laughs> totally fair. I appreciate Brian Wilson, and he's going to tell us what's going on on the drive, and that's next on Super Talk.
<sighs> it has been such a busy show. I have been unable to get to the fact that Tennessee banned emotional support dogs in restaurants. <laughs> You know, I say these things just to get a laugh out of Wilson. <laughs> Brian Wilson joins us. Yeah. I know I was, you talked about that yesterday. I, I think talked I about you. that yesterday. Yeah. Oh, oh, hold on a second. What is what, that? Oh, what happened about. there? Uh, yeah, yeah, and I, and I, of course, I always I wonder what would happen if somebody tried to take a French bulldog and make it an, a, an emotional support animal in a restaurant. It would be utter chaos. But yeah. I mean, I, I've always thought that was a scam. And you know, you, yes. you see it on planes. And you know, that's not an emotional support dog. This person is just trying to find some way to get their dog to travel with them on vacation. That's, that's all right. really, really it is. And so I'm glad <laughs> that the governor signed that. There's, there's, a, there's a couple other interesting bills that uh, the governor's got on his desk. One would hold parents responsible for the actions of their children if they commit crimes. We're going to talk about that today. Wow. Yeah. And that, I mean, that made it all the way to uh, the governor's desk. It has been revised slightly. We'll talk about that. I'm, I'm fascinated by Riley strain and we'll have the latest on that. And uh, Hunter Biden did not show up, but uh, Tony <laughs> Bobulinski had a lot to say today uh, at a hearing on Capitol Hill about Biden incorporated. That's my lead story coming up right after the news. Absolutely love it. There's Brian Wilson, and he is on the way with the drive right after Mac Moore's newscast, which is happening right now. I know I will be listening, and I hope you are to the drive this afternoon until 7 o'clock. We're back tomorrow, starting at high noon for another edition of the Matt Murphy Show. Until then, have a wonderful afternoon, folks. Thanks to my many guests today. Back tomorrow. Hug your loved ones. So long, everybody.